If they're hearing me talking, they need to get on the road right now. That's Lake Charles, Louisiana Mayor Nick Hunter in his final briefing before Hurricane Laura makes landfall, emphasizing that officials there expect catastrophic events from this storm, now begging and pleading with people to get out now. Breaking news, the massive storm now a Category 4 with winds of up to 115 miles per hour and nearly 40-foot waves. Officials warn the storm surge will be, quote, unsurvivable. Mass evacuations now underway and sheltering complicated by COVID precautions. We're live with full coverage across the region. Deadly unrest on the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin. A teenager accused of opening fire on demonstrators, killing at least two people who were protests in the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Hundreds of National Guard members being deployed tonight. Meanwhile, breaking news from the NBA playoffs. The league postponing tonight's games after the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted in protest to Blake's shooting. The CDC under fire tonight for its COVID testing about face. Their new guidelines come while Dr. Fauci says he was under general anesthesia for surgery. At night three of the Republican National Convention, Vice President Pence taking center stage as President Trump takes criticism for politicizing a pardon and the swearing in of new citizens. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. You heard that dire warning from one Louisiana mayor. Get out. There are hurricanes and there are really bad hurricanes. Well, Hurricane Laura has the potential to be catastrophic. This is how that monster storm looks from space as it barrels toward the Louisiana Texas border. We have seen evacuations all day long. The outer bands of the storm already making their way closer to shore. And of course, this is all happening on the third night of the Republican National Convention. The storm set to make landfall shortly after Vice President Pence addresses the nation. We'll have more on that in just a minute. But first, our team coverage of Hurricane Laura. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is in Port Arthur, Texas, a city that's in the danger zone for this Category 4 hurricane. Ginger, time this out for us. What, and what has you the most concerned? Yeah, I mean, the National Hurricane Center today, Lindsay, said unsurvivable storm surge, 10 to 20 feet. And the warning for that starts just about here along the state line in Texas, right through southwestern Louisiana. I want to just place you for a moment. Right behind me, this is Sabine Lake, and the Gulf of Mexico is just there. The storm is to the southeast by about 120 miles. Now, I want to also remind you how susceptible this land is. They have a very shallow base that goes up to these homes. If you put 10 to 20 feet of water, you're covering some of the homes over the rooftops. I saw this in Hurricane Michael. The power of storm surge is the thing that is the most dangerous and deadly in hurricanes. And this storm will be known not just for the storm surge, but I want to take you to the maps and show you it's also going to be about wind. So as this eye approaches, we're looking for the timing. The, the deteriorating conditions are already started, but we're going to really see it get bad late tonight and then landfall after midnight. So watch the timing here. You've got 50 or 55 mile per hour winds, right? And it's midnight. Now this thing comes on shore and the winds kick up to 105 or 126. I think we could easily see 130, maybe even 140 in some, some places. That does considerable damage and it doesn't stop there. Look as it moves north into central Louisiana. We're going to see wind damage and power outages all the way up to Arkansas with this storm. But again, coastal, and you say coastal because it's storm surge and usually you don't have storm surge go more than a mile inland. But in this case, the way the water works here, we could see storm surge 10 to 20 feet, 30 miles inland. Lake Charles, Louisiana, one of those places we are so concerned about. But even the storm surge back to Galveston, still upwards of three to six feet. And then over even to New Orleans or just south of New Orleans, they're starting to see that push of water too. So the track is really important because remember I said tropical storm force winds, not only from Houston to New Orleans tonight, but look how far up it goes right through Shreveport. By tomorrow night, you'll still be seeing very gusty winds. It'll pass by Little Rock and make that right turn over Kentucky, get picked up and spit out into the Atlantic by the start of the weekend. But again, I think it's so important that people realize how wide the impacts will be, even though the brunt of the force of this storm is going to come right along the state line. Knowing that those hurricane winds can extend out, I think we'll see a lot of tree damage. I think we're going to see a lot of power outages, and we're going to be talking about this storm, unfortunately, for weeks. And I think this one will go down in the books. Remember, this area saw Rita. That was 115 mile per hour winds, a Category 3. 
state has never seen a Category 4 hurricane. So this could be a first for southwestern Louisiana. And unfortunately, it does not look like it is going to be uh, slowing down before it makes landfall, Lindsay. Just disastrous potential. Ginger, thanks so much. Over now to Louisiana, where the city of New Orleans and points west are taking the storm very seriously, as they should be. The people in that region are no strangers to some big ones. Uh, Rob Marciano is in Louisiana. We're going to talk with him live in just a moment. But first, here's his report. Tonight, the time to evacuate is over. Laura's coming ashore. Packing 145 mile per hour winds and what the National Hurricane Center is calling unsurvivable storm surge. Here come the first bands of Hurricane Laura. It's only going to get worse. Hurricane hunters flying into Laura's eye today. The storm now more than 400 miles across. The surge from this storm is going to push water for miles inland at a height of 10 to 15 feet. That's water easily up and over my head. That's up and over this roof line. The surge will be even higher than that near the coast, and it's coming in the middle of the night. We met Freddie Rosti, who has to ride out the storm at this Lake Charles blood bank. We're hoping that this wall does what it was made for. So that he can supply hospitals with needed blood. I've been doing it for 30 years, and that's what I'm here for. Louisiana's governor activating the entire National Guard. Trucks that can be used for high water rescues staging north of New Orleans. And if you think you're safe because you made it through Rita in southwest Louisiana, understand this storm is going to be more powerful. The military evacuating B-52 stratofortresses from Barksdale Air Force Base. Our Matt Gutman in Beaumont, Texas. And officials are especially concerned about Beaumont here and Port Arthur, home to 55% of the nation's strategic oil reserves, most of its jet fuel, and also some of the biggest refineries in the country. Back in Lake Charles, the mayor tells me he's worried too many have decided to ride it out. I'm going to be honest, I am concerned that uh, we didn't have the evacuation numbers that uh, we probably should have. Rob joins us now live. So, Rob, for those who have chosen to ride it out, what kind of conditions can they expect? Well, we're in a bit of a lull right now. It's pretty pleasant, but over the next couple of hours when the, the inner rain bands start to come in, it's really going to go downhill in a big hurry. Obviously, the winds are, are, are a, a big concern, but I think the people that did stay around, they did so because they think they survived Hurricane Rita 15 years ago, and so they'll be fine with this one. But it's this one's bigger, it's stronger, it's going to have a much higher surge than Rita, so that's why we're all very much concerned for anybody that chose to stick around based on uh, that event. I think... We're we're going to see water not just get into the city, but engulf the city and, and many, many neighborhoods, dozens if not hundreds of homes are going to be impacted by this surge. So that's going to be uh, the one, the, the signature, I think, of this storm, Lindsay. All right. And folks in that area, as you talked about with Rita, they've uh, already endured. They've seen storms. They're used to it. What's unique uh, about this storm? Is it the storm surge? It's a surge, but the surge, remember, is driven by the wind, and this one has stronger winds. We've got 145 to 150 mile per hour winds. That's nearly Category 5. Rita, Katrina, Audrey, which also came through here, they were all Category 3. So this is a full Category plus uh, higher, and it's a big one, too. So that pushes even more water up. Lindsay, it's really going to be not just the storm surge, which is going to flatten homes in Cameron Parish, uh, but, but winds widespread in this area are going to be over 100 miles an hour. And we don't say that with confidence very often. But this storm is a beast, extremely dangerous, and those kind of winds over several hours, I mean, it's like a tornado, a giant tornado cutting through here. So trees, structures destroyed, obviously power out for probably weeks. I mean, life's just going to be different here uh, for these poor folks over the next, uh, after, to after tomorrow, after, uh, uh, after Laura comes through. And it's coming in the middle of the night, and which is, as, you, as you've experienced, a frightening, frightening scenario. So hopefully people will get out while they still can during the daylight. Okay, Rob, thank you so much. And as we reported, more than half a million people have been ordered to leave their homes but the pandemic has brought a whole new dimension of trouble to the situation. Marcus Moore has the very latest on the efforts to find shelter safely. 
Tonight, the largest evacuation since the COVID-19 pandemic began. More than 500,000 people, a mass exodus of families getting out before Laura moves in. Samantha Cuevas, a mother of three, waited until this morning to decide to get out. Why are you deciding to leave? A tree falls, power, a fire breaks out. This is not where I want to be with an 18-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 4-year-old. Hundreds unable to evacuate on their own, waiting hours in the hot sun for a bus out of Galveston, forced to choose whether to risk their lives at home or risk the coronavirus in a shelter. Don't want to be in a shelter, don't want to be infected, don't want to infect anybody. There have been more than 300,000 COVID-19 cases across the areas in Laura's immediate path. We got turned down for buses because my mother has corona. In Austin, frustration when evacuees from the storm zone hoping for hotel rooms were told there were no more vouchers. They were supposed to have, you know, something for us. Um, give me a tent. I don't care. Something. And tonight, concern over pets and livestock, too. In Winnie, Texas, officials shutting down a bridge to help ranchers get 1,100 cattle to higher ground. Back in Galveston, Mark and Jenna Metzger are staying, in part to keep an eye on their 90-year-old neighbor. What about the people who say you're absolutely crazy for deciding to stay here? Well, then they've never been in this situation before. You know, a lot of people that choose to ride off these storms, like our neighbors and myself, we've been in these situations our entire life. A real catch-22 for so many there tonight. Marcus Moore joins us now live. And Marcus, officials are urging evacuations, but what kind of specific precautions, if any, are being taken for evacuees that are most at risk to the virus? Well, uh, Lindsay, they have been uh, encouraging them to practice social distancing. And also, you uh, may have heard us mention the evacuations, people being loaded onto buses. Uh, they were limiting the capacity of those buses to evacuate people out. And also, they're utilizing available hotel rooms in nearby cities uh, to allow people to evacuate and, and be safe. And, and what are the conditions that are giving officials there in the Galveston area the most concern? Uh, well, uh, where we are right now, right along the seawall here in Galveston, uh, they're most concerned about the strong wind gusts that might knock out power, as, as well as the storm surge. We've seen the water already uh, today coming up quite high to where I'm standing right now, and they only expect it to get worse as Laura works its way through the Gulf. Meantime, some people just enjoying the beach right behind you. Hopefully they are getting ready to be prepared and, and perhaps evacuate if need be. Marcus, thank you so much. And joining us now, Stephanie Wagner, spokesperson for the American Red Cross in Louisiana. Can you please update us on the latest relief effort happening right now as your state gets ready for a storm surge, which has been called unsurvivable? Yeah, we've been readying our workforce and stocking up supplies, staging them in areas that can be easily accessible for days, almost a week now, to make sure that we can respond to whatever may come. And we're very glad that we were planning a few steps ahead as we weren't sure what the extent or the depth of this e event was going to be. And with it now coming on shore as a Category 4, potentially Category 5, we are going to force our localizations and officials to make sure we can respond accordingly. And what's your biggest piece of advice for someone who's still in a danger zone and how the Red Cross can help? Well, first, we want to encourage anyone to listen to the direction of your emergency officials. They know what the right thing is to do, and we want to get you out of harm's way, as do they. So please listen to your emergency officials, and if they tell you that you need to leave, please leave. If you have passed the point of no return where you are unable to leave, please go to a higher level of your home. Um, you need to go in an interior room in the event that there are any tornadoes, and you need to just keep a very close eye on what is happening with the weather outside. After this storm has passed as we start to see what is happening in the environment and you know the scope and the extent of the damage that has occurred we encourage folks to call 1-800 red cross and we will be there to support them with whatever they need and of course we're still right in the middle of a pandemic as well the louisiana governor today called it a serious issue still imploring people not just to pay attention to the storm but also covid so how challenging is it to deal with both an active pandemic and a major storm at the same time 
There are certainly complications that come with dealing with COVID-19 in the midst of a multiple hurricane scenario. But what it's allowed us to do is really hone our skills to assure that we are delivering our services in the safest, most comprehensive way. We're providing PPE for any residents should we need to open up any shelters. We are adjusting how we deliver services for a lot of those to actually be done in a virtual capacity, including casework and disaster health and mental health services. And we are able to fulfill all the needs of a community with a portion of our workforce on the ground and the rest of it being done virtually. But our delivery as far as what we are going to do for the communities has not changed. And what's being done to help the most vulnerable who typically would be brought to mass shelters and require medical care? So our state is handling all of the sheltering at this current time, so I can't speak to those details exactly. But what I can speak to is our Red Cross shelters. And as folks are coming into our Red Cross shelters, they are going to be cared for. They will have their temperatures checked. We will have additional screenings. We will actually have people separated into a general population and an isolation area. So those who aren't feeling well or may have come into contact with somebody who is COVID positive, they can still feel comfortable in knowing that they should seek help and they can come to seek refuge with the Red Cross at any point in time. And we will have health services individuals there as well to meet the needs of those individuals that are a little bit different now with this pandemic. Stephanie Wagner with the American Red Cross. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We appreciate it. And we turn now to the third night of the Republican convention. Tonight's headliner will be Vice President Mike Pence from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. One night after the White House was used numerous times as a backdrop for speeches and videos in a convention that has defied a number of traditions already. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. The line between the Trump campaign and the Trump White House is blurring beyond recognition as the stage is now set for the president to give his acceptance speech here on the South Lawn. Already, the president has enlisted his secretary of state to address the convention while on official travel. I'm speaking to you from beautiful Jerusalem. And he's used the Marine Honor Guard. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States and his acting Homeland Security Secretary as props, taping a naturalization ceremony for the convention. Congratulations, you're now citizens of the United States of America. Signing a pardon for the convention, too. Last night, a quartet of Trump spoke, including the president's son, Eric, and his younger daughter, Tiffany. And the first lady turned the Rose Garden into her stage. Unlike many of the other speakers, she addressed the pandemic head on. The invisible enemy, COVID-19, swept across our beautiful country and impacted all of us. My deepest sympathy goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one, and my prayers are with those who are ill or suffering. She also spoke about the national reckoning on race. I have reflected on the racial unrest in our country. It is a harsh reality that we are not proud of parts of our history. I like to call on the citizens of this country to take a moment, pause, and look at things from all perspectives. Melania, they're one of the only speakers during the convention to mention the racial unrest in our country at this time. Jonathan Carl joins us now. The theme of tonight's convention is land of heroes. So what can we expect tonight, John? Uh, well, the marquee speech tonight is the vice president, Mike Pence, will be at Fort McHenry, a site chosen because it is there, of course, that the flag that inspired the writing of the national anthem uh, flew during uh, the battle during the, the War of 1812. Uh, but it's interesting, Lindsay, uh, Pence, like the president, has often criticized professional athletes who have kneeled uh, to protest racial injustice. And on this day, a day when all of those NBA games uh, are being canceled in the wake of of the police shooting in Wisconsin, I am told that he is actually uh, not not planning uh, to repeat that criticism of, of the kneeling athletes. And, and John, we heard the first lady weigh in on racial unrest in our country, but we've yet to hear the president comment on the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha. You think any chance we're going to hear anyone reference that tonight? 
Well, it, it's a good question, but but you are right to point out that the president simply has been silent on that. Uh, he's he's criticized uh, some of the aftermath, the violence that we have seen on the streets in in Kenosha, the the, the protesting. Uh, but he has said absolutely nothing about that police shooting. If I had had a chance to ask him a question today, that was certainly what I intended to ask him. But he has avoided those questions and avoided any comment on that. Jonathan Carl from the White House. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Lindsay. And now to the abrupt testing reversal by the CDC, saying testing isn't necessary in most cases. Now, that advice is the complete opposite of what the CDC chief told ABC News and others last month. Tonight, the governor of New York is blasting the move, saying the only plausible rationale is that they want fewer people taking tests. So what's changed? ABC's Steve Osinsami at the CDC in Atlanta. Public health experts far and wide can't believe it. The new guidelines quietly shared on the CDC's website say that even if you've been in close contact within six feet of a person with a COVID-19 infection for at least 15 minutes but do not have symptoms, you do not necessarily need a test unless you are a vulnerable individual or your health care provider or public health officials recommend you take one. It's a huge change, and ABC News has learned it happened at a White House task force meeting August 20th without the nation's top infectious disease doctor, who was under anesthesia, away getting surgery. Just last month, the CDC and other health officials were saying something different. Anyone who thinks they may be infected independent of symptoms um, should be and should get a test. The New York Times tonight is reporting that the change comes from the top down, from a president who believes the pandemic is being used to hurt his reelection campaign and who is on record saying he'd like to see less testing. When you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. His critics are having a field day. Shame on them. This all is being politicized, and yes, we will be investigating. He now has CDC carrying forward his political agenda. Uh, and it is frightening, and it is alarming. This reaction online from a public health expert speaks for many. This change in policy will kill. But senior White House officials and the administration's testing coordinator insist tonight that this was driven by science and not politics. There is no direction from President Trump, the vice president or the secretary about what we need to do when. Our source connected to the White House task force says that people in the trenches are horrified by all this. They're concerned that this damages the public's trust in this agency, the CDC, and that it sends the wrong message to Americans about the dangers of being infected with COVID-19, being out and about and not knowing you're infected. Lindsay. All right, thanks so much to you, Steve. And when we come back, the chilling images, a man opening fire on demonstrators protesting the shooting of Jacob Blake. The investigation into the incident now underway. Russian forces accused of ramming American troops in Syria will explain. And could the IRS owe you money from this year's tax filings? Stay with us.
Welcome back. We turn now to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake have turned deadly. Two people killed, one seriously injured, according to police. The frightening images of a young man with a long gun shooting at protesters shortly after another shooting nearby. A teenager arrested across state lines is now charged with homicide. Hundreds of National Guard troops arriving in Kenosha as that city braces for another explosive night. Our ABC's Alex Perez reports again from Wisconsin. Tonight, this graphic video shows a man opening fire on a crowd in Kenosha, Wisconsin, shortly after another nearby shooting. As authorities brace for a fourth night of demonstrations in the wake of Jacob Blake's shooting by police. Officers are trying to disperse a crowd violating curfew Tuesday when the chaos spirals. A video showing a man running down the street with a firearm, a crowd chasing behind him. That man falls to the ground and begins shooting. Kenosha police saying two were killed and one was injured in shootings overnight and that a group of men, many armed, had been patrolling the area where the violence happened. Authorities in neighboring Illinois today arresting 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse to face, according to court documents, first-degree intentional homicide for his alleged role in the fatal shootings. Police saying the suspect was allegedly there to resolve whatever conflict was in place. I had a person call me and say, why don't you deputize citizens who have guns to come out and patrol the city of Kenosha? And I'm like, oh, hell no. The unrest comes after the police shooting Sunday of 29-year-old Jacob Blake. Videos appear to show Blake struggling with officers before getting up, walking around to the driver's side, appearing to lean in, and an officer pulls his shirt, shoots him in the back. Seven shots ring out. Blake's three boys, ages three, five, and eight, in the car. His family says he's in the ICU and paralyzed from the waist down, his mother demanding justice and peaceful protests. For anyone who's doing anything that is violent or destructive, please stop. I, I get your pain. I get your frustration, but please find another way. The governor of Wisconsin deploying 500 National Guardsmen and local authorities pushing curfew earlier to 7 p.m. President Trump tweeting he will be sending federal law enforcement to restore law and order, but the administration offering no specifics. Biden taking a hard line there. We're joined now by Alex Perez. Uh, you report that President Trump has weighed in on the protests and offered federal support for that. But has he made any statements about the actual shooting of Jacob Blake, which prompted this unrest? Hey, Lindsay, yeah, at this point, President Trump has not made any specific comments about the shooting of Jacob Blake or the officers involved in that shooting. And as for that help that he offered to the governor and the officials here in Kenosha sending federal help, uh, he did not mention any specifics as of just yet. And Lindsay? what's the latest update on Jacob Blake's condition? Well, there is some good news on that front, Lindsay. His family says they've learned that there is a possibility in the future that he could regain the use of his legs. Oh, very Lindsay? positive, very positive there indeed. Okay, Alex Perez, thank you. Stay safe. And now to the NBA players taking a stand tonight after the Jacob Blake shooting. The Milwaukee Bucks decided not to play tonight's game in protest. Other teams are now following suit. The boycott now spreading to Major League Baseball as well. Our Adrian Bankert has more. In a historic move tonight, the NBA announces all playoff games tonight will be postponed following this week's police shooting of Jacob Blake. Players boycotting in protest. The Bucks have been in serious discussion about boycotting tonight's game. The Bucks versus Magic, Houston Rockets versus Oklahoma City Thunder, and LA Lakers versus Portland Trailblazers games all to be rescheduled after some of the biggest stars in sports decided enough is enough. LeBron James enraged on Twitter saying we demand man change sick of it LA Clippers head coach Doc Rivers giving a powerful statement after his team's win last night we're the ones getting killed we're the ones getting shot it's amazing to me why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back 
Our thanks to Adrian Banker for that. And at this hour, Milwaukee's baseball team, the Brewers, have also decided not to play tonight. And according to ESPN, more baseball teams are consider considering following their lead. We'll continue to stay on this story. And we still have lots more to get to here on Prime. An update on the search for another missing soldier at Fort Hood. Why researchers trying to find a vaccine are growing increasingly alarmed by the lack of diversity in the trials now underway. And President Trump has transformed the federal courts during his term. We'll take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, a message from Melinda Gates on Women's Equality Day. Let me speak, ancestors, of the great warrior Mulan, the loyal, the brave. Welcome back, everybody. As we head into night three of the RNC and a headlining speech by Vice President Mike Pence, we expect to hear some strong appeals to social conservative voters. So tonight we'd like to take a look by the numbers at how President Trump has been shaping the federal courts, including the Supreme Court, in what will likely be one of his longest lasting legacies. So far, President Trump has put in place 203 Senate confirmed federal judges with lifetime appointments. Today, 25 percent of all active federal judges are Trump appointees. These include 53 appeals court judges. They're the powerful regional judges who often get the last word on far-reaching legal and social justice issues. President Obama successfully appointed only 55 appeals court judges in all eight years of his presidency. Trump has already put two justices on the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, the same number as President Obama during both of his terms. Trump's judges have been reliably conservative. Also, 75 percent have been men, 85 percent white. And still ahead here on Prime, we continue to track that monster hurricane barreling toward the Gulf Coast. Our weather team is standing by with the very latest. The massive movie bust. Prosecutors filing charges against a group they say stole nearly every movie made in the last decade. What to look for tonight with night three of the RNC set to kick off in less than an hour. But first, here are some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com.
Welcome to Disney. faces a rise in deaths in at least 26 states plus Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico, a surprising reversal from the Centers for Disease Control when it comes to testing. New guidance now says if you have no symptoms, you don't necessarily need a test, even if you may have been exposed. That means being within six feet of someone who may be a carrier for at least 15 minutes, contradicting what CDC Director Robert Redfield told ABC last month. Anyone who thinks they may be infected independent of symptoms um, should be and should get a test. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo saying the sudden shift strains credibility and follows President Trump's policy of denying the problem. The only plausible rationale is they want fewer people taking tests. It totally violates public health standards and rationale. The House of Representatives now investigating the recent change, which comes after FDA Commissioner Dr. Stephen Hahn apologized for overstating the benefits of convalescent blood plasma during a press conference with the president. They found Sergeant Elder Fernandez hanging from a tree. Police say they believe they found the body of another missing Fort Hood soldier about 30 miles from the Texas Army base. 23-year-old Sergeant Elder Fernandez was last seen August 17th. His family says he reported being sexually harassed. Police say foul play is not suspected. Fernandez is the third Fort Hood soldier to disappear in the last year. Two others found dead over the summer. Look what happens when you report sexual harassment at Fort Hood. You get bullied, you get hazed, you get harassed, you turn up dead. Most movies that came out over the last decade have been stolen and put online. Federal prosecutors say it's the work of an international video piracy ring, costing studios tens of millions of dollars. Three people have been charged, dozens of servers around the world shut down. 
A welcome surprise for taxpayers. Nearly 14 million Americans will receive unexpected money from the IRS. The agency is making interest payments to taxpayers who filed their returns by the July 15th deadline but haven't received their refunds yet. The payments average $18 and will be sent by check or direct deposit. Welcome back. The race for a COVID-19 vaccine continues with several vaccine candidates now in the critical phase three trial stage involving thousands of Americans taking doses. But a critical piece of effective trials is having a diverse population of volunteers to ensure that the vaccine is safe and effective for all populations. And right now, some trials may be falling short. Here's Bob Woodruff with our weekly vaccine watch. Today, pharmaceutical giant Pfizer, amidst their ongoing phase three trial, announced that only 19% of their volunteers were black or Hispanic. These numbers have disappointed some health officials. The participants are not as diverse as I would have wanted. They should look like our country. Maybe they even ought to oversample the people who've had the hardest time with this disease. Scientists want reassurance that a COVID vaccine will work no matter your age, gender, or race. But the ongoing trials testing for safety and effectiveness may actually lack an adequate racial diversity. Uh, it is almost five times higher likelihood of hospitalization from COVID-19 for African Americans and Hispanics and Native Americans than it is uh, for whites. But despite these health concerns, these current studies are struggling to find diverse volunteers. For example, Moderna's phase one trial. And out of 45 participants, I was one of two uh, black individuals who participated. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I was very shocked to see that. And I just remember a lot of people who I told uh, that I was participating in this, they were very concerned. <laughs> and they were questioning uh, whether I was going to be safe. A scientist herself, Sophia says she trusted the trial's safety, but understands others' concerns. The history of uh, mistreatment of people of color, uh, especially black individuals, and uh, sort of being misused or misinformed um, about scientific trials. And so you can point to examples such as the use of uh, HeLa cells, uh, the syphilis Tuskegee trials. The Tuskegee experiment was started in the 1930s when the government secretly studied the effects of syphilis on 600 black men. The participants were denied diagnosis and proper treatment. That's very much ingrained a sordid past uh, between the medical community and specifically uh, uh, the black community. People always mention the historical past missteps in science, but today we're in a different situation. In the breathless search for a vaccine, it's the job of people like Dr. Asifa McConan to win the trust of those in minority communities, to encourage them to volunteer. There's a huge knowledge gap in terms of what clinical trials are. What are their purposes? How are they conducted? Dr. McConan's hospital is administering Moderna's phase three trial. The knowledge gap uh, goes also with a lack of access. Most clinical trial sites are located not in the neighborhoods. So what I've been trying to do is going directly to community leaders, religious authorities, religious networks, to church, to uh, elders, trying to explain to them the benefit of this. Moderna and Pfizer say they are working to improve these numbers. Trying to address to the Spanish community as well, you know, bilingual call center uh, recipients, bilingual ads, ads in Spanish, working with union workers. These are trusted leaders, their opinion counts. And that's the type of uh, action that we're taking. I think it's paying off, but we have to continue this dialogue. I want people to know that if they can't trust the government, that's, uh, that's all right, but please trust the science. This is Bob Woodruff, tracking the race for a vaccine. Our thanks to Bob for that report. And let's go back to our coverage of that extremely dangerous storm set to make landfall soon. Greg Dutra from our powerhouse Chicago station, WLS, joins us now. Greg, Hurricane Laura is certainly closing in. It is. And the National Hurricane Center said in one of their recent updates, unsurvivable storm surge. I mean, 
that says it all. Category four, category five, just a number at this point here. As you see a very well-defined, sharply defined eye as this system makes its way inland. We're already seeing some of the outer ram bands make their way in, prompting a tornado watch that goes until 9 p.m. Central Time. There's already been a handful of tornado warnings with this too. And as we draw closer here through the overnight hours, making landfall, it looks like shortly after midnight, we are going to see widespread destruction, especially in the highest winds of the storm, which could in some cases is top 120 or 130 miles per hour. And, and just walk us through once again the biggest concerns dealing with the storm surge. The winds are obviously huge. Storm surge is something that is much worse. That's the unsurvivable part of this. You can shelter in a bunker that is completely reinforced and you can survive 140, 150 mile per hour winds, but you cannot hide from the water. That is going to get in. The storm surge warning stretching all the way across Interstate 10. That is more than 30 30 miles inland. Look how high these storm surge get as this thing moves on shore. 10 to 20 feet expected, unfortunately, in the same exact communities that saw the most widespread destruction from Hurricane Rita. Again, here is that Category 4 or 5 storm. It's going to be really close on the borderline as it makes landfall. Moving on shore, and look how wide it spreads over on the eastern side, the dirty side, the right front of this storm. You see that high storm surge going all the way, perhaps, to Lake Pontchartrain out in New Orleans. Now, let's drill down on the timing. This storm is expected to be making landfall not long after the vice president finishes his address to the nation tonight. That's right. That's right. And during the overnight hours, it's going to be a long night for a lot of people here. And I'm sure the president and vice president have been briefed multiple times on this as it makes its way inland. The National Hurricane Center doing updates every hour now. Here's a look at the timing. This is 10 o'clock, right around about that time frame that you had mentioned. Winds getting up to around tropical storm force. Then we get the right front of the storm. And from Lake Charles, which is well inland, about 30 miles inland down to the shoreline where there's Port Arthur. There's also Holly Beach there. There's Cameron. Again, the same spots, unfortunately, that got completely wiped out by Rita. They're going to see those winds anywhere from 100 to up to 130 or 135 miles per hour, perhaps even higher if this thing does continue to strengthen. At that point, anything above 110 miles per hour, two by fours, when houses are destroyed, actually become projectiles and go through other walls. So a catastrophic storm. It is going to reap widespread destruction until Finally, it gets absorbed in the greater flow of weather, makes its way through Arkansas, but we could even still see 70 or 80 mile per hour gusts as this makes its way inland, finally weakening, then moving through northern Kentucky and out through the mid-Atlantic. And Lindsay. potential disaster in the middle yes. of a pandemic. Okay, Greg Dutra from our Chicago station, WLS. Thanks so much, Greg. And we are joined now by Trump campaign senior advisor, Corey Lewandowski. Thanks so much for joining us, Corey. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So before we turn to politics, I want to continue on Hurricane Laura approaching the Gulf Coast and potentially having a devastating impact. Are there any plans to shift gears possibly for the convention in any way tomorrow night if this is really problematic, this storm? Well, I don't want to get ahead of the president on any announcements, but I can tell you that he's been meeting with uh, the officials from FEMA. He's been tracking this very closely. He's been talking to the elected officials in the states that are impacted. And uh, so it is going to be a decision that the president makes. So I don't want to get ahead of that, but I can tell you he is very up to speed on all of the latest developments. Understood. Okay, now the Trump campaign was critical of Joe Biden for not providing enough specifics on his plans in his convention speech last week. So looking ahead to tomorrow night, will the president outline a specific second term agenda to the American people? And if so, anything you can give us a preview of? Well, he will be outlining a specific agenda. First and foremost, he's going to remind the American people where our country was just four short years ago, the economic despair we had, our military, which was depleted, uh, our friends around the world didn't respect us, and our allies didn't, and our enemies didn't fear us. He's going to talk about that and talk about how far we've come in just four years and what's at stake for the next four years. The next four years ahead of us is continued economic prosperity under Donald Trump, continuing to deregulate the federal government so small business owners can be successful successful, making sure that everyone has access to good quality health care. And uh, I, again, I don't want to get too far out in front, but I can tell you it's going to be reminding the American people that America's greatest days are still in front of her. Now, First Lady Melania Trump's speech was widely praised last night, especially for her acknowledgement of those who have been hit hard by COVID-19. The president has defended his response to the pandemic and pointed to things that he says that he did right. But would you say that he needs to do more to address or acknowledge why nearly 180,000 Americans have died in the U.S., far surpassing any other country? 
Well, we are surpassing every other country. We're also doing much more testing. You know, we, we're testing more than anybody else. I think more than all of the other countries combined, the number of tests we've done. And this president has used the Defense Production Act to allow every American to have access to personal protective equipment, which, if we recall, wasn't that long ago. And this president has said we have to have a personal responsibility and B, you know, people should be wearing face masks everywhere they go. So the president has said one life lost is one life too many. But because of the swift actions of this president, specifically banning flights coming in from China, he saved American lives. Well, he's also said it is what it is when talking about how many Americans have lost their lives to, to COVID-19. Do you feel that that was inappropriate to say? Well, I think, look, the president, like every American, has known someone who has contracted the virus. We know that some of his friends have died from this COVID-19 virus. This is a very serious pandemic that's facing the globe. And because of the swift actions of the president, specifically, we closed down our government, not because we had an economic problem, but because we had an underlying health problem to flatten the curve. Remember, some of the experts told us that, you know, it could be one to two million people who will have succumbed to this virus if we didn't do what the president did. So he's taken swift and decisive action on this. Now, the president often touts his handling of the economy, but Democrats argued last week that the president inherited a growing economy with declining unemployment when he took office. And they point to this fact in particular, that in the last three years of the Obama administration, 8.1 million jobs were added, while in the first three years of the Trump administration, 6.6 .6 million jobs were added. So would you say that the president can really claim that he did that much better uh, when it comes to jobs before the pandemic than the Obama-Biden administration? Well, you also have to remember the, the Biden-Obama uh, administration claimed that they inherited a terrible economy from the previous administration, the George W. Bush administration. But the truth was, under this administration, the Trump administration, the lowest unemployment numbers for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and women ever recorded. More than that, there were more Americans working prior to the pandemic hitting our country than ever in our nation's history. This president has, has brought more people out of poverty in three years than Barack Obama did in eight. Many of them were children. And so, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. The record stock markets, again, just today, I believe the NASDAQ hit another high. Uh, our economy was booming. And the repatriation of jobs that had been offshore, 500,000 manufacturing jobs came back under this administration, where we know that under the previous administration, those jobs went overseas. Now, Joe Biden also pointed his experience helping the economy recover from the Great Recession, including managing the auto industry's recovery. What specifically uh, can the president point to showing that he can help manage getting the economy back on its feet from the current rate of double-digit unemployment? Well, again, because of the president's desire to give people access to capital, uh, the PPP program, which allowed many small business owners to keep their people employed, we've seen a V-shaped curve take place. 1.8 million new jobs have been added in just the last few months. Uh, and we were at the lowest unemployment rate our nation had ever seen. And we'll get back there. But you have to remember, we closed the economy, the president closed the economy to save American lives. And we're now seeing that economy coming back to life. And the tr truth is, small business owners, by and large, many of them have survived and kept people on the employee employment rolls because of the swift action of this president with the PPP program. Now, lastly, a speaker from last night's convention, as you know, was removed at the last minute after she retweeted a QAnon thread that included anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. But at the same time, the president has invited GOP candidates who support the QAnon conspiracy theory to attend his speech tomorrow night, and he's welcomed the support of QAnon followers. Why is the president doing this, and does he need to directly reject the supporters of this conspiracy theory? You know, I don't think the people care about QAnon. Most American people that I talk to don't even know what QAnon is. I think they care about the safety and security of their homes, their families, their businesses, getting their kids back to school and closing our borders, which is contrary to what the Democrats talked about for a week. The Democrats said they want open borders and closed schools. The Democrats want to defund the police, not defend them. The Democrats say that the men and women who serve on the thin blue line every day don't deserve the same respect of those who want to run through the streets and destroy police substations and hurt innocent men, women, and children. This president doesn't care about QAnon. What he does care about is the safety and security of Americans. Corey Lewandowski, thank you so much for your time, especially during this busy week. Thank you very much. And we'll be right back as we get ready for night three of the Republican National Convention.
Convention. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins us now to break it all down for us. What are you looking for tonight, Rick? Well, the setting is so much of this, and the fact that the vice president is going to uh, give his speech to close down the evening at Fort McHenry in Baltimore tells you a lot about the theme. It is his night. Uh, we're told to expect the president to be in attendance as well. So a, a lot of patriotism, and I think continuing the themes, attacks on Joe Biden, of course, uh, and an attempt by, uh, by the Republican Party to, to rewrite a lot of recent history in a favorable light for President Trump. And, of course, you just mentioned a vice president is set to speak this evening from Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Explain the significance of that location and what it likely means that he's going to focus on in his speech. Yeah, that is a, a key battle in the War of 1812, and it's famous as the battle that was the inspiration for Francis Scott Key to write the Star-Spangled Banner. So again, the flag is still there, and it will be there. Uh, a, a replica, a giant replica of the flag is there at Fort McHenry. Uh, you'd imagine that's, that, that symbolism to be a major part of the messaging uh, throughout the night, uh, almost literally wrapping the president in the flag as he, as he gets into uh, tomorrow night, the night that he actually accepts the nomination. And we've seen speakers the last two nights dismiss protests over policing this summer as rioting and looting. But as Kenosha, Wisconsin is reeling over the shooting of Jacob Blake, what do you see Republicans doing on the messaging on this tonight? I think you're going to see a lot more of it tonight, uh, Lindsay, and talking to some Republicans. They're cognizant of the screens that are filling people's uh, minds the last couple of days and hours. And uh, the, the focus that Republicans are going to take is on the uh, on the protests, including some violent confrontations. That's what they want to talk about. That's something that the president's been talking about for a very long time. They're less apt to talk about the incident itself. Uh, the president himself has not addressed the, the, the shooting. And I don't expect that to be as direct a piece of the messaging. But the theme of uh, of, of, of protests, of violence in American cities is something that Republicans are dialed into. And I'll tell you, I've talked to some Democrats today who are worried about those images, those visuals being part of convention week. Now, finally, we saw questions raised last night about official government locations and resources and traditionally nonpartisan events like a naturalization ceremony being used for political purposes. Is this legal, what we're observing, this use of, of the White House? Yeah, quite possibly it is illegal. There are uh, firm regulations and even federal laws that prohibit uh, public resources, public officials, taxpayer-funded dollars from supporting anything that has an explicitly political purpose. And there are explicit rules governing conventions that appear to have been flouted by the Secretary of State and are being flouted by White House officials and aides. Now, uh, the Republican National Committee, the Trump campaign, says that they have complied with all of the laws here. Uh, there are a lot of Democrats on Capitol Hill and beyond who think otherwise and have uh, started proceedings to look into this. Uh, but the fact is that there may not be any remedy in the short term, that uh, while these things could be illegal and are certainly rule-shattering, precedent-breaking, there's nothing that stops them from happening unless the president wants to stop them, and he is not inclined to do anything of the sort. Rick Klein, thanks so much. We appreciate you. Thank you, Lindsay. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, the empty NBA court after the Milwaukee Bucks decided not to play their playoff game this evening in protest over the shooting of Jacob Blake. The other two games scheduled to take place tonight also have been canceled. Every NBA player is invited to join a meeting happening at 8 p.m. in the bubble. The players will talk about how they plan to proceed. And that is our show for tonight. I'm about to switch sets and be joined by Tom Yamas and our powerhouse political team as we begin day three three of the Republican convention. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
America needs four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. Vice President Mike Pence, center stage tonight. A loyal number two who lets the president shine, taking a rare turn in the spotlight. We're going to make America great again. As the Republicans make their case for four more years, the Gulf Coast braces for a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Live from New York City and across the country, here now, Lindsey Davis, Tom Yamas, and the ABC News powerhouse political team. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Night three of the RNC. The amount of turnover in the president's first term has been remarkable. But tonight, Mike Pence, the man who has stood by his side and has defended the president throughout, makes his case for why they should continue to lead. And, Lindsay, the theme of tonight is the land of heroes. There have been so many heroes over the last several months during this pandemic. COVID, for the most part, though, has not been front and center during this convention. Even though, look at that, nearly 6 million Americans have been infected more than 179,000 dead. Vice President Mike Pence, who led the coronavirus task force, will deliver the headline speech tonight. Kellyanne Conway, the woman who led the president's campaign to victory in 2016, will also speak just days after she announced she would soon be stepping aside for family. Also speaking tonight, Karen Pence and Laura Trump. All of this, but as we come on the air right now, another threat, the potentially catastrophic hurricane. Laura taking aim uh, on the Gulf Coast, a life-threatening Category 4 storm. Hundreds of thousands evacuated in the middle of this pandemic. Our powerhouse roundtable is with us in New York, D.C., and across the country. But first, let's start in the storm zone with this monster storm incoming. And we want to begin with our chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, who's in Port Arthur, Texas. Now, by the time Vice President Pence delivers his speech right around in the 10 o'clock hour, that storm will be even closer to landfall. Ginger, what concerns you the most? Storm surge and wind. I'm talking about unsurvivable storm surge. That was actually what the National Hurricane Center said. So Tom and Lindsay, I have moved across the bridge away from Pleasure Island because we did not want to get cut off. Now on the other side here in Port Arthur, this storm was just updated to 150 mile per hour max sustained winds. That's seven miles per hour short of being a category five hurricane. They've never in modern history seen a category four hurricane in this part of Louisiana. I'm, of course, in the Golden Triangle of Texas, but right along this state line, that is who's going to feel the most impact, that deadly and dangerous storm surge and the winds upwards of 140 plus. Let's go ahead and dive into the maps. I want to show you the monster. You've probably seen it at some point today, but it is just still surreal to watch that less than 120 miles now from our location headed north northwest. Now we'll put the tornado watch on because those are always a problem with tornadoes. Those feeder bands and now those outer bands could spin up an easy tornado all throughout the southeastern portion of Louisiana. Baton Rouge are included there over to the Golden Triangle here. And then the timing, right? So after midnight, I think it makes landfall somewhere between 1 and 3 a.m. And check that out. That's 4 a.m. Eastern time. 127 mile per hour winds stick around until 7 a.m. for Lake Charles. Lake Charles is one of those places that is so low lying, even though it's so far inland. That's why we're talking about storm surge potential 10 to 20 feet that could go 30 miles inland. See that storm surge warning? It stretches more than 400 miles at the Texas and Louisiana coast. Most importantly, too, is I don't want anyone to forget, of course, the brunt of the force is going to be felt here right along the coast and a little bit inland. But there will be inland power line and tree damage all the way up through the state of Louisiana and far eastern Texas, even into Arkansas, because those tropical storm force winds extend hundreds of miles outside of the center. So you'll feel them from Houston and Galveston all the way to New Orleans tonight as that moves north, even Shreveport by tomorrow morning is going to be feeling potentially a category one storm. They'll become a tropical storm as it moves through and Little Rock under a flash flood watch because rainfall of course, an issue too, but I think this storm, they all have their unique fingerprint or footprint. This one will be known for the incredible storm surge and those strong winds. Tom and Lindsay. And that means likely catastrophic damage. All right, Ginger Z, you and your team stay safe tonight as you ride out the storm. I want to bring in Marcus Moore now. His team is in Galveston, which is an island off of Houston. And Marcus, we've heard about this deadly storm surge there from Ginger, a mandatory evacuation issued for your area. But I've seen some of your reporting. You've spoken to people in Galveston who are staying there. 
Yeah, absolutely, Tom. As, as, as with any storm, people are often uh, reluctant to leave their homes, and that's what we have learned from people here in Galveston, where right now there is a curfew in effect after this mandatory evacuation in Galveston. And, Tom, throughout the day, we've experienced those on and off periods of rain. Right now, the sun is peeking through, and there's a steady breeze, and you can see the angry waves just behind me as Laura churns in the Gulf. What officials are most concerned about here in Galveston is the strong wind gusts possibly knocking out power to the city. They are also concerned about the storm surge that is expected to be four to six feet here in Galveston, and that is to the west of where Hurricane Laura is expected to make landfall overnight tonight. That storm surge potentially disastrous. Marcus Moore, thanks so much. We're joined now by Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. Thanks so much for joining us, Senator. Yeah, thank you for having me. So you're in Baton Rouge right now. What are officials in your state saying about how dangerous this storm could be for the Gulf Coast? And, and what's your message to Louisiana residents at this moment? Yeah, my message earlier was get out. If they had told you to evacuate, you should already evacuate. Now, frankly, it might be a little bit too late. But still, nonetheless, if you've not evacuated, it's going to be difficult to have folks come and rescue you because, as one warning said, with this surge, for the next 48 hours, there'll be portions of Louisiana that are part of the Gulf, meaning that the surge is so high, all land will be covered for as much as uh, 48 hours. So, so if you haven't got out, try and get out. Do you believe that your state can adequately handle evacuations and shelter needs given the constraints of the pandemic? You know, my state has a lot of practice in disaster management. And yes, I do, simply said. Uh, I was on the call with the governor's uh, task force earlier. Clearly, coronavirus means that you can't put people in large gymnasiums unless you have to. But they have filled up hotels from New Orleans to Shreveport. Uh, one person put it, uh, it's a little ironic. We don't normally think of New Orleans being as a safe haven during a hurricane, but in this case they are, and that's where folks are being uh, put up in hotels. Senator Cassidy, Tom Yamas here. Talk to us about the area of Lake Charles. What is your biggest fear tonight? Yeah, so people have evacuated. There's about 200,000 people there. I've spoken to law enforcement and others. There's a lot of petrochemicals. I'm told that they have lock down their petrochemical operations so that you know we don't want to have an environmental disaster too. So I'm reassured that that is all being taken place per protocols. Uh, I think as much as anything, they've locked it down. Some things you can't help. Our commissioner of agriculture was saying, you can't move that many head of cattle at once. There will be cattle, herds of cattle that will die. Uh, but on, uh, on the other hand, I'm hopeful and speaking to law enforcement, that most folks who live there have evacuated. Let's hope so. So much is ongoing right now, even as this hurricane is about to hit the United States. We've talked about the pandemic, about COVID-19. We, we know you recently tested positive for COVID-19. You're also a doctor. First, how are you feeling? And the big news today is the change in the guidelines from the CDC that Americans don't need to get tested, even if they've been close in contact with someone. As a doctor, do, do you think that's sage advice? Well, I'm not quite sure what their strategy is. Um, uh, I'm in quarantine right now, so uh, I'm in a garage apartment. But, but for example, universities and schools, uh, it does seem an appropriate strategy to be able to screen people as they're coming to school to make sure they're not positive and to periodically do that to make sure infection does not enter. We hear of infection in schools, most typically it's coming from the community in. But it reassures folks that you catch those students or staff teachers as they come in and ask them to quarantine. So I've not yet read the rationale. CDC is good, uh, but it does seem as if there's some settings in which you would want to do so-called surveillance and making sure that people are not entering a situation being positive. You can catch them on the way in. When you have people being discouraged from being tested, do you think that this could lead to another spike in infections if fewer people are diagnosed and the disease continues to spread in communities? You know, we clearly have the power within ourselves to shut down transmission. And if people wear their mask, wash their hands and sneeze into their sleeve, we're going to do a lot to decrease that transmission. Um, testing is one aspect of that. And it does seem like testing, for example, in nursing homes, has been able to decrease the death rate in nursing homes as staff as they enter every day are checked. So it does seem to be part of a good strategy. 
I will say the people at CDC are smart people, so I'd like to read their full rationale by why, uh, as to why they're saying what they're saying. Senator Cassidy, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, let's bring in our Mary Bruce, who's covering all angles of the convention for us. And Mary, are there any big changes made to the programming tonight because of this hurricane? I mean, this really is a monster storm. I'm sure you will hear it impact the tone that we hear from some of the speakers tonight. They are likely, of course, to reference the hurricane. I'm sure uh, send their thoughts and messages to those who are in the storm's path. But so far, uh, we have not seen it derail any of the plans here tonight. Uh, I, as you would imagine, I'm sure the administration, the White House, are keeping a close eye on all of this as it unfolds. And so we, too, will be keeping a close eye on how it may impact plans here over the next 24 hours. But so far, uh, everything is going ahead as scheduled. Tom. Mary, tell us where you are tonight, and, and we know you, you were going to be talking about what Vice President Mike Pence is going to say tonight. He's head of the task force that the pandemic may be the single biggest issue of this election, and there is a stark difference in the way Republicans are talking about the pandemic and Democrats were last week. Yeah, the vice president, of course, is the head of the coronavirus task force. It is his most high profile assignment yet in the Trump administration. And tonight, right here at the historic Fort McHenry, Mike Pence will be selling the president's record on the pandemic and other issues. And, you know, in this role leading this task force, the vice president really has had uh, to juggle in many ways uh, the interests and requests of state leaders, the recommendations of scientists and our nation ex nation's experts, and, of course, the mixed messaging coming from the president. Mike Pence, though, is known for his diplomatic tone. Let's be honest, right? He has, he has a very different style from the president, and he has been adept in the last four years at, at walking a fine line, uh, never publicly disagreeing with the president, often uh, sort of quietly turning a, eye, turning a blind eye to areas wh where the president may have made controversial statements or divisive remarks and actions. So we'll be watching closely tonight to see how uh, Mike Pence explains the administration's record on this pandemic and, of course, other issues going forward as he makes the case for the next four years. Now, as I mentioned, we are here at the birthplace of the Star Spangled Banner. And you can see behind me about 100 uh, uh seats lined up here. We will be, uh, Mike Pence will be speaking before an audience of veterans, uh, service members, first responders, Medal of Honor recipients, because tonight is really all about honoring uh, our nation's heroes. And while Mike Pence is taking the spotlight tonight, a role he doesn't often have in this administration for all eyes to really be on him, we have learned and can now report that the president himself is expected to be here at the end of the night for what I'm sure will be a made-for-TV moment celebrating uh, some of our wounded warriors. All right, Mary Bruce, thanks so much. We're joined now by Rachel Scott from the White House. Rachel, let's talk for a moment about the shooting of Jacob Blake. He was shot in the back by police several times. The president has not weighed in, even as his death has sparked outrage and protest. And that's in stark contrast to former Vice President Joe Biden. Lindsay, silence from the president on the shooting of Jacob Blake. He was briefed on it days ago, but so far has not made any public comments. Instead, what you're seeing from the president is him leaning into his law and order message, saying that the governor of Wisconsin should call in the National Guard to help with the racial unrest and the violence in his state. And that does serve as a sharp contrast to what his rival Joe Biden is saying. Biden put out a video today saying that the shooting of Jacob Blake makes him sick to his stomach, asking Americans to put themselves in the shoes of black mothers and fathers as they watch that video of a black man being shot in front of his children. Now, Joe Biden and Senator Kamala Harris, his running mate, have spoken to the family of Jacob Blake. Tonight, the White House is declining to say whether the president is going to speak with that family. I just asked uh, his senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway, moments ago whether or not the president is going to call the family. She did not have an answer. But tonight, in the hours following the racial unrest in Wisconsin, in just days before we see a march on Washington protests here in the nation's capital. We are also seeing the security perimeter around the White House expand tonight. Guys. All right, Rachel Scott, thank you for that. We're going to dive a little deeper into that topic later in the broadcast. We want to bring in our powerhouse political table right now. I want to start with Matthew Dowd, our chief political analyst. Matthew, this is not the first time a hurricane has impacted a convention, and President Trump has to be incredibly careful here because the way he responds to this catastrophic storm will be watched closely for the next several days. 
That's true, Tom. And first, I, I have friends and family in Port Arthur and Orange and Bridge City, everywhere where Ginger is right now. So thoughts and prayers to them and everyone else that's the, under this onslaught that's about to hit there. I think it's a very difficult moment. I mean, if, for the vice president tonight, who's going to be talking in the midst of this, and the president tomorrow, it's hard to separate your roles as leader of the country from what you're doing as a party. And if it looks like you're tone deaf or disconnected from a tragedy that's befalling the country, it's going to hurt you politically in this. So I think it's a very fine line that they're going to have to walk. If I were the president of the United States, I would say I'm canceling my convention speech and speaking from the Oval Office about the hurricane. In most people's minds, it would be simultaneously the same thing, but it actually would send a signal on that. But so I think it's a it's a moment they could grasp if they do it right, but it's also a moment, Tom, where they could fall if they are tone deaf in the midst of this crisis facing the country. Two storms, right? A hurricane and racial unrest. Two storms simultaneously facing the president and the vice president. You could say three storms with the pandemic as well. Yep. Uh, Matt Dowd there with uh, not, not some advice for the president, but maybe he is listening. That would be a bold move to address it from the Oval Office. I want to bring in Terry Moran now. Terry, we are still dealing with this pandemic now as we deal with the social unrest and the hurricane. We're going to hear from Vice President Mike Pence, as Mary Bruce said. He was the leader of the task force. And we've, we've heard really two narratives about this pandemic. We heard a little bit about it in the First Lady speech yesterday. She sort of struck this motherly tone about it. It was not really consistent with the other Republican speakers we've seen, drastically different than what we saw with the Democrats here. When it comes to politics, how, how can you shape a message with this pandemic when it seems to change every single day? It seems to change every single day, Tom. You're absolutely right, as does the president's and the administration's policy. We had a major development today with the CDC quietly changing its recommendations on who should get tested for the coronavirus. They say if you, even if you've been in contact with someone who has the coronavirus, you don't need to get tested if you don't have symptoms. And that runs absolutely counter to the best practices of countries around the world which have got on top of this thing in order uh, to open the schools, open the businesses. But Donald Trump's uh, perspective from the beginning has been, get this thing away from me. It's going to magically disappear, he said, 180,000 lives ago. And he wanted testing to be done by the states. The governors are in charge of it. He has constantly tried uh, to downplay it. His own economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, in last night's speech at the convention, talked about the pandemic in the past tense. It was tough, wasn't it? It was really hard. And now here is the CDC taking this, this perspective. It's going to be very hard for most voters to accept that Donald Trump has conquered the pandemic, given the, the death rate and the fact that with the, the United States, with 5% of the world's population, has more than 20% of the world's deaths. It's a bad track record that he's going to have trouble, and Vice President Mike Pence, who's the head of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, is going to have trouble spinning. And let's bring in Republican strategist Sarah Fagan. Sarah, what's your response to the RNC ignoring uh, Jacob Blake and, and really playing coronavirus kind of to the left? Well, I think certainly the vice president and uh, the president have to acknowledge racial unrest, if not Jacob Blake's situation, Wisconsin situation specifically. Um, uh, Melania Trump did that last night. It was very appropriate. As to the uh, coronavirus, you know, there's been a, some vignettes. There's certainly been some focus on health care workers. We heard from a nurse. Um, but this election is being dominated by this pandemic. It is the single biggest reason why, why Donald Trump is behind in the polls. So on one hand, I can understand because it's not gone as well as, as anybody would like it to, that they haven't focused as much on it. You don't typically walk into a weakness uh, as a candidate. On the other hand, I think it needs more attention. And certainly tonight, Mike Pence needs to talk about it, not only because it's the right thing to do for the Trump reelection, it's the right thing to do for Mike Pence, who has big political ambitions. All right, I want to bring in, uh, sorry, Lindsay, I, was, I want to bring in Yvette right now to talk about this, the CEO of Democracy for America, progressive group. So the Democrats say that, that President Trump has made the pandemic worse. Joe Biden said his negligence has led to more deaths. 
How do the Democrats make the argument things are really bad right now, but as soon as we get elected, things will get better? You know, I think um, Joe Biden tried to do that when he talked about what his response would be on day one, right? He talked about nationwide ma a mask mandate. He talked about making PPE available. I think the one outage was he didn't talk about making people whole from an economic perspective, and I think they need to talk about that. We do have a lot of great Democratic senators who are talking about a UBI of $2,000 a month while people get through this, a rent moratorium. But we're just not seeing that um, penetrate on the on the Senate side, unfortunately. We're not getting any movement on that. So I think they continue to hammer that message that basically what we're going to do is we're going to make you whole. You know, you know if, you, if you're worried about getting um, coronavirus, you don't have the adequate health care. A lot of people, because they're unemployed, your, your health care is attached to your employment. They don't even know if they want to get tested because they can't handle the treatment, right? How am I going to pay for that? How am I going to take the days off work if I am working? And so I think Democrats just need to hammer home, not just that Trump got this absolutely wrong at every single stage, which he did. But here's how we're going to make you whole, and here's why that's important, Tom, because on January 21st, this pandemic will still be here. To try, and try what are you going to do on January 21st? And so I think they can hammer that home every single stage, not so just he, what he did wrong, but what is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris going to do on January 21st to make this better for people? So and I don't think he's gotten it totally wrong. I think he has missed opportunities, you know, once a week to go to the podium and say, wear a mask, wash your hands, stay six, six feet apart from your fellow citizens. He, he did that in the beginning. He needed to do that every week. It, it's an exercise where leaders need to do it over and over again so it catches on. And there was some perception of mixed messages. Certainly governors had their own perspective on this thing. Um, but he did do some things right, and this is what they need to talk about more. He did impose the Defense Production Act. He did it very early, and we are not having a conversation today about not having ventilators, which was very much a conversation we had early in this. He did that after a it, lot of pressure from governors oh, and from th Democrats. It, it, that's just not accurate. That is bet. actually and very so true. He also <laughs> rallied, he rallied uh, a lot of companies to produce PPE. And we're not having a conversation where we can't get PPE in this country. So some things have gone right, and they should not be shy about championing those. But in fairness, if he had acted earlier, right, because for January and February, the majority of that time, he was saying it was a hoax, it's going to miraculously disappear when the weather warms up. And it has been said yeah. that each week that he could have started earlier getting this word out would have saved tens of thousands of lives for each week that he got ahead of it. You know, I think... He should have done things earlier, but hindsight is always 2020. Almost no country in the world got this right. And, and certainly there is footage of every single political leader, from Nancy Pelosi to major news anchors uh, around this country talking about, this is kind of like the flu, you know, go out, celebrate, you know, live your life. We've seen that. That's a, you could play that today. So he, he should have had it right. He had more information than some of these other people, uh, certainly. But this wasn't a Trump phenomenon alone. Can I talk about how wrong he got this just very quickly? One, he just started wearing masks, like in the last couple weeks. He's still calling it a Democratic hoax. On Monday, when he gave his opening speech, he said, on November 4th, this thing is going to go away. He, he, um, he, he made a game of giving PPE and equipment to certain governors that he liked and didn't like. He's still calling it the China virus rather than taking responsibility for our part. And he did delay significantly, as you said, Lindsay, his response, which did cause, they, they said we would have an 82 percent reduction in death had he responded earlier, and he did not. This was an epic failure at every stage. At one point, he even told people, I think, to put bleach in their mouth or something. His, the, the scandal around hydrochloroquine, now he's trying to advance this unexpected, untested um, uh, treatment that we don't know about. I mean, this has been a failure at every stage, and I think he should acknowledge that, and I think if he wants to be taken seriously, acknowledge that and say, here's how I'm going to do it. But, but to be fair, Democrats also have had their own problems on this issue. I mean, just even here in New York, you have a mayor and a governor who want to send kids back to school, and you have your very strong teachers unions and your principals union who say don't send them back to school. I agree, and I think that's absolutely wrong. And I will criticize my own party for that. But they're also not saying we got. To, I'm not saying they got everything right. They got a lot of things right without the help of the federal government. By the way, the fact that governors had to go to go uh, overseas to get their own equipment because our own president wasn't making that available, and then had an equipment lottery. Like if I like you, 
and if I don't like you, I mean, that was how Gretchen Whitmer, for instance, got a lot of claim to fame. He failed at this. He failed. And even we're talking about the convention this week. We are, seeing, we are seeing people not appear in masks during this convention. How insensitive, even if they are being tested before they go, how insensitive to pretend like there's this alternate world where the rest of the world isn't wearing masks. It's disrespectful for them not to be socially distancing during this convention and not wearing masks. Period. I mean, look, <laughs> it's fair to give the president some criticism on this. It, it absolutely is. But it's also appropriate to call out when he was right, like banning travel from China, putting the U.S. comfort up in New York when it looked like it was needed. And he was praised by Governor Cuomo for that. So this is a certainly a mixed bag for him, but he has some things that he can point to, including not a uh, wacky treatment, convalescent plasma has been used for other um, other diseases. And so, you know, I give him credit for demanding that that be put available quicker. And All right. All right, Sarah, we're going to give you the final word on this because we want to go back to, to the hurricane because this is a catastrophic storm. I want to bring in ABC News contributor Tom Bossard, a former Homeland Security Advisor to President Trump. Tom, we saw some of the missed opportunities from the Trump administration in regards to the coronavirus. We've just spent 15 minutes talking about it. Do you think we're adequately prepared to deal with a major hurricane and a pandemic? Well, I think we have to do it whether we like to or not, right? And so I think we're adequately prepared at the federal level to respond to the hurricane. Uh, we have to wait and see what the state and local officials do, what the people do. And in many ways, that's the same answer I would give to you right now uh, with the pandemic response. It's a shared responsibility. People have not responded adequately. Leadership has made mistakes at multiple levels. I think that's really indisputable. Uh, and now with the hurricane, we're going to have to respond to it because this is a life-saving, life-sustaining uh, phase, the operation where we all want to make sure that people are out of the path of these catastrophic storm surges, uh, out of the path of the flooding that's inevitable here over the next few hours and, and days, and then in places where they can receive shelter, food, and water. And there's really no way to do that unless people already have some other place to go or they have a congregate shelter mass care facility where they can receive assistance from volunteers tiers and from the federal, state, and local governments. Uh, they're going to have to do that and they're going to have to do their best to try to avoid spreading any virus in those environments. But I don't think you have any choice but to do it. You can't uh, let the virus scare you into not receiving food, water, and shelter. So I'm pretty confident that FEMA will have uh, its plans sharpened and its uh, supplies and personnel deployed properly for this hurricane. Uh, it's time for compassion. It's time for some warnings. I'm pretty certain that we're close to, uh, you know, of course, it's always important to listen to the local, uh, you know, specific guidance as you're in this decision-making mode, but we're getting close. We're getting close to that point where you can't get out if you haven't already. So, uh, if your preparations haven't been made and you haven't gotten out of out of harm's way, uh, boy, you know, you, you're really in for a heck of a ride. And and remember that drowning kills most people uh, in these circumstances. So, uh, ready? Yes, uh, but I'm I'm certainly not resting well. Yeah, the wind will hurt you, the water will kill you. That's what they always say with these big storms. But Tom, I, I assume you, you still right. speak to people, you know, within the FEMA community, within the Homeland Security community. What's the sense of, of professionals in this area? Are we ready for this Category 4 storm? Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with where these storms hit. You know, a Category 4 storm hitting New Orleans dead center would be a much different and more uh, troubling affair than what this current path has taken. That's not to downplay this path, uh, but for right now, if things hold, it looks to be threading the needle between Houston, who really can't afford to take another flood event at this stage, given uh, the, the ongoing recovery uh, from Hurricane Harvey, and New Orleans, which has, as we all know, a really troublesome, uh, complex, interwoven system of levees in different parishes and so forth. So they've got pumping systems and levees on one side of this, and they've got uh, really uh, poor drainage and high density population centers to the left of this. If it goes right through the middle, I'm worried that Louisiana with a lot of people in low country are really, they're really going to take a hard hit here. Uh, but the level of preparedness will depend on the path of this storm. All right, Tom Bossert, ABC News contributor. Tom, we thank you for your time. We, we hope the people are prepared. We hope they've evacuated. Thank you so much for that. We're going to have much more here on ABC News Live. We have new developments in the shooting of Jacob Blake. We'll have that new reporting after the break, I, I, along with the FBI saying QAnon could pose a domestic terrorist threat. But there are some Republican candidates for Congress who support the beliefs, and the president says he welcomes the follower support. We'll have much more on this. Stick it right here with ABC News Live.
they say the difference between a hockey mom and a pit bull? Lipstick. Major convention moment right there. Sarah Palin stepping onto the national stage at the 2008 Republican convention. Republicans this week have tried to project party unity in lockstep with President Trump. But outside that virtual convention hall, there have been a lot of Republicans lining up against a second Trump term. Well, intra-party rebellions are hardly new. This year has been extraordinary. And as Devin Dwyer reports, it's a debate over what it means to be Republican and who lays claim to the soul of the GOP. As Republicans rally around Donald Trump, the president faces a wave of high-profile defections. He is going to hear from more people that served in his administration, and he is going to hear more of them gave the same testimonies that I gave, which is that he's ill-equipped to hold the office that he has. Former members of the Trump administration and dozens of veteran GOP officials coming out against Trump's re-election and his vision for the party's future. Because I am gravely concerned about the conduct and behavior of our current president, that I stand here today. Former Arizona Senator Jeff Flake, who's never voted for a Democrat, on Monday joined more than two dozen former Republican members of Congress to publicly endorse Joe Biden. That after 73 Republican national security officials ran newspaper ads calling Trump a danger, a view shared by former Trump national security advisor John Bolton. Decisions are made in a very scattershot fashion, especially in the uh, potentially mortal field of national security policy. And four Republicans last week went even further, speaking out against their own president at the Democrats' convention in prime time. In normal times, something like this would probably never happen. But these are not normal times. An extraordinary Republican family feud that many in the party's rank and file seem to be shrugging off. The president has sky-high support among Republican voters, drawing enthusiastic crowds and raising record-setting cash, more than $165 million in July alone. Donald Trump is going to win in November, and the reason he's going to win is because of the results of the last four years. Republican congressional candidates like Jake LaTurner of Kansas have been giving Trump an unconditional embrace, even in close races with Democrats. Trump has done what he said he was going to do, and we have seen great results from that. The divide over Donald Trump and Trumpism has raised existential questions for Republicans, both about party identity and loyalty. Is loyalty to Donald Trump a prerequisite to being a Republican right now? I think right now the president has made that the, the one defining thing, and he has the Democrats certainly pushing that because it helps them. It's time we talk about this. Some Republicans are fighting back. GOP activists group the Lincoln Project spending millions of dollars attacking Trump on TV. National Party leaders insist the values of Republicanism remain unchanged. But Trump has challenged some of those values since 2016, giving even his most loyal supporters cause for concern. Is that your Bible? Well, I wouldn't hold up the president as uh, an example of the kind of uh, moral uh, uh, or religious perspective that, that I preach. Evangelical pastor Bart Barber of Farmersville, Texas, plans to vote for Trump in November, but said he worries about what the president's behavior is doing to the party. I absolutely think that the Republican Party has lost ground morally. People for whom that's the most important thing, uh, moral and spiritual credibility, uh, find themselves uh, homeless uh, in a lot of ways right now. There's also tension over Trump's embrace of the political fringe, from birtherism and white nationalism to online conspiracy theories like QAnon, which the FBI calls a domestic terror threat. Well, I don't know much about the movement other than I understand they like me very much. Uh, which I appreciate, but I don't know much about the movement. The movement believes a satanic cult of pedophiles and cannibals has infiltrated the government and that Donald Trump will save it. At least three GOP congressional candidates have openly embraced QAnon. Joe Ray Perkins of Oregon, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, and Lauren Boebert of Colorado. If elected, they'd be the first to give the conspiracy theory a foothold in U.S. government. I think we should be very concerned about the president president saying positive things, whether it be about QAnon, whether it be about white nationalists, 
it appears doesn't matter what you represent or what you might do. If you say he's okay, then he's okay with you. While top Republicans have strongly disavowed QAnon and white nationalism, many have been careful not to directly or loudly criticize President Trump himself. One sign his grip on the party remains firm. If Trump wins, I think you will see Republicans pull away from this cult of personality and still have new voices and pull away from his more divisive elements. And if Donald Trump loses uh, in November, do, do you think the party kind of goes back to the way it was before he was elected? The Republicans really would have an opportunity there to be a stark contrast to what is going to be sort of a statist left wing. So I see a much more diverse Republican Party in the future. For now, the president is convinced his Republican Party has a winning message for four more years. The question is, will voters buy it? For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Our thanks to Devin for that comprehensive report. And let's bring back our powerhouse political roundtable. Mary, want to start with you. Uh, we heard Devin there talking about Republican defectors, but in Congress, lawmakers have pretty much towed the president's line so far. They have, and you heard as Devin noted there that the Republican Party is now the party of Trump. You have very rarely seen Republicans on Capitol Hill being willing uh, to stand up to the president. We will hear tonight from some of his most uh, ardent supporters, those who are most vocally uh, behind the president on Capitol Hill, Lee Zeldin, Joni Ernst, Ernst Marsha Blackburn, Elise Stefanik, uh, but even those who aren't uh, as vocally supportive of the president as they are, are loath to cross him publicly. You know, when you look at the list of those, uh, as Devin pointed out, who are now speaking out, uh, backing Joe Biden, there aren't a whole lot of people on that list, I don't think any, who are, who are sitting members of Congress. And that's because in order to speak freely, it has become clear that Republicans, if they want to stand up to the president, uh, it is better for them politically if they do so after they are out of office or on their way out the door. The big question is what comes next and how the party may change going forward. And of course, there is a real concern from Republicans that I have talked with about what it means in this election and whether there will be an impact down ballot, because especially as the president's poll numbers have taken a hit from his handling of this pandemic, from the way he has responded to the national reckoning over racial justice, there is a real concern that now the Senate uh, could be at risk and that essentially that this loyalty to the president could backlash, especially in some key battleground states. Lindsay. And, and let's bring Terry Moran back into the mix. Terry, the FBI has viewed QAnon as a threat, but in Colorado and Georgia, too, Republican candidates who've supported this theory could actually end up in Washington. We remember the rise of the Tea Party. Could we now be perhaps seeing the beginnings of the rise in fringe believers within the Republican Party? We sure could. They, look, the Tea Party, or whatever you think of it, had, a, had a, a set of ideas and principles rooted in reality. QAnon's insane insane cannibals and pedophiles taking over the world and everybody was part of it and there's that oh, Barack Obama smells like sulfur I mean th th that's insanity and the fact that it has such a foothold in the Republican Party is a disgrace and as far as the Republican Party is concerned look you know you go out and talk to Trump supporters at any rally I, I know that uh, Rachel and Mary and all of our colleagues have been there they don't care they don't give a fig about your old Republican Party. They want to know what Trump wants, and they're with him. And the notion that it, it, should Trump uh, win or lose, that the Republican Party is going to go back to being the party of Bush or Bob Dole. By the way, no previous Republican nominee for president is at this convention. They weren't invited, not Mitt Romney, not George Bush, not Bob Dole, because that party's dead. This is the party of Trump, and we've seen this around the world. When, party, when parties get taken over by a kind of populist movement, they don't go back. Uh, we are living with the new Republican Party, which should be dubbed the Trump Party. Terry, thank you for that. I want to talk about some breaking news that's coming in tonight, Yvette. Uh, there are boycotts happening in real time tonight. First with the Milwaukee Bucks. They've decided not to play their playoff games tonight. The NBA canceling those games, postponing them. We're also seeing this with the WNBA and also in baseball. Do you think there's a danger for the Republican Party tonight 
to not address what's happening in the sports world. Of course, this is all tied to the police shooting of Jacob Blake. I think that's right. I think it's going to be hard for them to do. First of all, let me say, I think it's a great thing. We're a far cry from Colin Kaepernick being on his own, taking the knee and folks kind of distancing themselves from him. As you know, even Roger Goodell has said he was wrong to do that. So you're seeing a lot of NBA players who are stepping out with their shirts on, Breonna Taylor's shirts on, Black Lives Matter. And I think this move tonight was exactly spot on. And I just want to say how much I support that. I think it's going to be hard for the RNC to do that, right? Because I think for some reason they have pitted the Black Lives Matter movement against law enforcement, which it isn't, right? We're talking about making sure black lives are protected. And I think they worry that if they bring this forward, then somehow that means they're not supporting law enforcement. So I don't think this is a part of their agenda. I think it's a missed opportunity if they don't. We actually heard during the roll call earlier this week, even some people saying, we kneel for the, for the Lord, we stand for our flag. So I think they worry about alienating a part of their base that just doesn't want to have this conversation. Yvette, also tonight, this is also breaking. We've gotten some new information from the Wisconsin Attorney General who says that Jacob Blake had a knife in his car under the floorboard of the driver's side. Uh, he, according to the Wisconsin AG, admitted that he did have a knife there. In your estimation, does this change anything about what, what has driven people to the streets and made them so upset about that police shooting? I don't think it does. And here's the thing that I think is really compelling. So you watch the footage of them basically stalking him, guns pointed to his car. That's the part of the conversation I think we need to have a conversation about. There were four officers who could have physically detained him and did not try to. And then they waited until he got to the car and then pulled him by his shirt and shot him. There was no opportunity for them to make an assessment of the situation. We don't even know yet whether he was even being held. And so that is what an investigation I hope will we'll discover. All right, Yvette, Terry, I want to bring you in on this also because I saw a video today that struck me. It was, it was a white business owner of a pizzeria in Wisconsin that, that had been destroyed. Uh, it, it looked like it, all the glass had been broken and he was pleading with the protesters, the demonstrators screaming at them, do you want to reelect Trump? Essentially saying, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to essentially fire up the other side. Do, do you think that's the case? Could that happen? Is there a danger here? Uh, I saw that video, and I, and I think there is a, a danger. It, it's natural. And, and I think Joe Biden, in his statement, uh, tried to walk that line, uh, supporting uh, an aggressive investigation of what does look like uh, a, a use of excessive force, at the very least in the shooting of this man, while his children were in the back seat. Uh, how much of a threat was he with his kids in the back seat? I, I, I think that Biden talked about that, and he said the destruction of property, the violence, uh, that doesn't help at all either. But what has changed the dynamic in this country and why this issue, I think, now runs against the Republican Party, where in the past, the cry of law and order after uh, public disturbances on racial issues uh, was an advantage for the Republican Party, is this. We all see these shootings now, and it's hard to live with them. Sarah, is there a way for the Republican Party to address this social injustice, this racial injustice, without alienating the base? Oh, I think absolutely. I, I mean, look, one of the tenets of being uh, a conservative, particularly being a Christian conservative, is that everybody is treated equal under the law. Uh, and so I think we need to talk about it more. Uh, I think Vice President Pence and the president need to address this in their speeches. I'm going to have to wrap you just for one second. We'll come back to okay. this point. Senator Marsha Blackburn is now speaking at the RNC. Let's take a listen. We need them most. They've stood at the forefront throughout this pandemic. The emergency room nurses who go back shift after shift, the medical researchers developing a vaccine and therapies to combat what the Chinese communist regime unleashed on the world. Cookville's Double Springs Church of Christ members lifting our country up in prayer and providing for those impacted by tragedy. But tonight, I want to talk to you about another kind of hero, the kind Democrats don't recognize because they don't fit into their narrative. I'm talking about the heroes of our law enforcement and armed services. Leftists try to turn them into villains. They want to cancel them. But I'm here to tell you, these heroes can't be canceled. Tennessee is full of them. After all, we're the volunteer state.
My dad served in the Army in World War II. When he came home, he put on another uniform and for 30 years volunteered to help our underfunded Sheriff's Department. I'm reminded of him whenever I see compassion and selflessness in others. When I see law enforcement officers put their lives on the line every single day to keep our community safe, in spite of the hatred thrown at them. When I see the heroes who volunteer to serve our country putting their lives on the line for our freedom. Many of these heroes call Tennessee home, and we could not be more proud of the brave men and women of the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell. The common thread between them is a deep-seated desire to serve a cause larger than themselves. They don't believe their country owes them anything. They believe they owe their country and their fellow man. As hard as Democrats try, they can't cancel our heroes. They can't contest their bravery. And they can't dismiss the powerful sense of service that lives deep in their souls. So they tried to defund them, our military, our police, even ICE, to take away their tools to keep us safe. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and their radical allies try to destroy these heroes because if there are no heroes to inspire us, government can control us. They close our churches, but keep the liquor stores and abortion clinics open. They say we can't gather in community groups, but encourage protests, riots, and looting in the streets. If the Democrats had their way, they would keep you locked in your house until you become dependent on the government for everything. That sounds a lot like communist China to me. Maybe that's why Joe Biden is so soft on them. Why Nancy Pelosi says that China would prefer Joe Biden. Yep, I bet they would. But President Trump has stood up for our heroes every day. He stood by our law enforcement, our military, and the freedoms we hold dear. He's made good on his promise to put America first. And I hope you will stand with me as we send him back for four more years with a clear message to the Democrats. You will never cancel our heroes. Hi, I'm Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Eight years ago in the fields of Helmand Province, Afghanistan, a close friend and teammate laid down cover fire against Taliban insurgents so that I could walk, blind and bloodied, to the medevac helicopter and survive. But he didn't. Dave Worson was killed two months later. He died a hero to this great country. Here's the truth about America. We are a country of heroes. I believe that, so should you. We are a people with a common set of ideals conceived in liberty. People that have sacrificed time and again for our freedom and the freedom of others. That's something no other country ever, anywhere, can claim. Since 9-11, I've seen America's heroes up close. Some of them saved my life. Some of them saved many others' lives. Many of them never made it home. These heroes acted as if the whole struggle depended on them alone, as if any weakness on their part would be a reflection of the whole nation. That's called duty. And America has a long history of it. Our enemies fear us because Americans fight for good, and we know it. It gives us strength. When our heroes are trusted and equipped, then freedom prevails. The defeat of ISIS was the result of America believing in our heroes, our president having their backs and rebuilding our military so we'd have what we needed to finish the mission. The cowering of the Iranian regime and the restoration of the deterrence once lost is the result of America believing in her own might again. But America's heroism isn't relegated to the battlefield. 
Every single day we see them if you just know where to look. It's the nurse who volunteers for back-to-back -back shifts caring for COVID patients because she feels that's her duty. It's the parent who will relearn algebra because there's no way they're letting their kid fall behind while schools are closed. And it's the cop that gets spit on one day and will save a child's life the next. America is the country where the young military wife with two young children answers the unexpected knock at the door, looks the man in uniform in the eye, and even as her whole world comes crashing down, she stands up straight, she holds back tears, and takes care of her family, because she must. This is what heroism looks like. It's who we are, a nation of heroes. And we need you now more than ever. We need to remind ourselves what heroism really is. Heroism is self-sacrifice. It's not moralizing and lecturing over others when they disagree. Heroism is grace, not perpetual outrage. Heroism is rebuilding our communities, not destroying them. Heroism is renewing faith in the symbols that unite us, not tearing them down. You see, America is a fabric. It's woven from the threads of history's best stories, best attributes, and greatest ideas. The American spirit reflects the oldest and most important virtues, self-sacrifice, courage, tolerance, love of country, grace, and passion for human achievement. We can decide right now that American greatness will not be rejected nor squandered. As the American founding was grounded in individual liberty, so will be our future. But if we are to rediscover our strength, then it must be an endeavor undertaken by each and every one of us. We must become the heroes that we so admire. America was built by them, and our future will be protected by them. It will be protected by you. So God bless America. We're just listening to Congressman Dan Crenshaw there highlighting the theme of tonight, Land of Heroes. And Sarah, I want to bring it back to you. You were just talking about how the Republican Party can effectively talk about social justice, racial justice without alienating the base. I don't think that it's mutually exclusive at all. I mean, the biggest predictor of somebody's partisanship is how many times a week they go to church. If you go to church uh, more than once a week, you're 90 some percent likely to be a Republican. The main tenet of Christianity is that we are all equal in the eyes of God. It's also enshrined in our Constitution. We should be talking about uh, equality. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is important that we have a strong police force in our communities. These things are not mutually exclusive. And right now we're having two conversations in this country. Uh, we have the Democratic Party, which is uh, talking appropriately so about all the racial unrest. And we have the Republican Party, which is talking appropriately so about a strong police force. We need to come together and talk about how we solve this problem. I want to bring in Matt Dowd now, our chief political analyst. Matt, I'm curious, what have the polls shown us when it comes to swing voters and this issue of social unrest? We just heard Senator Blackburn say the phrase, cancel our heroes, essentially grouping cancel culture and defund the police together. But I'm curious, if this race is so close, what have swing voters said, at least to pollsters, about what's happened over the last few months? Well, first, I think Senator Blackburn is dead off where swing voters are in this country, and it's completely opposite of what Sarah was just recommending, which is her thing is don't mention anything what's going on and celebrate the police as if there's not a problem in police departments across the country. It's, most swing voters think the police have too much power, it's been militarized. There's some structural problems in the police force. They need more training, and we ought to address racial inequity in the country. They think everybody's equal. They think everybody ought to be equaled equally, but swing voters also know that black voters and brown voters and all kind of voters of color have not been treated equally in 240 years of our country. They know that, and the only reason why we're having this conversation today and trying to address this today is as what was said earlier, which is the phones people are using to record people and what's going on. And so, I, to me, the, the Democrats, yes, sided overwhelmingly with racial injustice, as they should, because that's the most unaddressed part of what's going on in the country today. The Republicans have to figure out a way to talk about that and not just talk about strengthening police forces. Yvette, is, is this a real fight? I mean, we have 10 weeks left. Is this a real fight within the Democratic Party, the progressives who do want to defund the police, who maybe are out there on the streets still to this day, and, and people like Senator Joe Biden and Kamala Harris who say they don't want to defund the police? You know, I think it's all about the degree to which we need to address this problem. Kamala has been 
been one of the most outspoken people on this issue of racial justice. And I think we're going to have a conversation about how we combat this issue of racism in the police department, whether there are some police departments that can be reformed and whether there are others that need to be divested from and other those some of those resources being used for other strategies to build community in, Afri in the African-American neighborhoods in our cities. All right, Yvette Simpson, thank you. We thank everybody on the powerhouse political team. We are continuing our coverage of the Republican National Convention at the same time. We are also following breaking news, Hurricane Laura, the social unrest in Wisconsin, so many breaking news, and of course, the pandemic. We'll have more coming up after this break, including George Stephanopoulos, David Muir, and much more of our coverage from the Republican National Convention. You're watching ABC News Live. With so much...
This is an ABC News special. America needs four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. Vice President Mike Pence, center stage tonight. A loyal number two who lets the president shine, taking a rare turn in the spotlight. We're going to make America great again. As the Republicans make their case for four more years, the Gulf Coast braces for a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Live from New York City and across the country, the Republican National Convention. Now reporting, Chief Anchor George Stephanopoulos. Good evening and welcome to our continuing coverage of the Republican National Convention. Night three already underway. We're going to see more members of the Trump family tonight, the president's daughter-in-law, Lara Trump. The long-serving aide who guided the closing months of his last campaign, Kellyanne Conway. And the headliner tonight, Vice President Mike Pence from Fort McHenry in Baltimore, the site of the battle that inspired Francis Scott Key to write the poem that became our national anthem. A night of pageantry and politics that collides with breaking news on our shores and in our streets. Protests continue for the third night in Wisconsin after the shooting of Jacob Blake in the back by police. A young supporter of President Trump who took up a rifle to confront Black Lives Matter's protesters there has now been arrested for shooting three. Two of the victims are dead. And in an extraordinary move, the NBA has postponed tonight's playoff games after the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted their game to protest the shooting of Blake. Meantime, Hurricane Laura bearing down on the Louisiana-Texas border, now a fierce Category 4 storm set to be one of the strongest storms ever to make landfall in the United States. So let's get the latest from Ginger Z in Port Arthur, Texas. Ginger, it looks pretty calm now, not for long. Not for long. We're about six hours from landfall, and these conditions will deteriorate rapidly. George, I have to show you the images here. This storm is going to be about wind and storm surge. That's what it'll be known for afterward, and it's going to happen here tonight, making landfall again after midnight. Look at the wind gusts, 105 Port Arthur, 126 Lake Charles. When you have three hours of 120 to 130 mile per hour winds or higher, because we have 150 mile per hour winds in that storm right now, that is going to do significant damage uninhabitable for weeks is what they're warning and then the 10 to 20 foot storm surge that could reach 30 miles inland that is what the national hurricane center is calling unsurvivable we are really looking for a very difficult night and especially because it happens in the dead of night George. and i know you will be on watch all night long okay ginger thanks very much now i want to go to mary bruce she's at fort McHenry in baltimore where the vice president is set to speak tonight another extraordinary setting mary George here at Fort McHenry. Tonight is all about honoring our nation's heroes. You can see behind me a crowd of about 100 gathered. It is made up of veterans, first responders, Medal of Honor recipients. And Mike Pence tonight will take center stage here. It is a spotlight that he doesn't often have in this administration. And we are told he will be selling the Trump administration's record and outlining their vision for the next four years. You can see the crowd behind me is somewhat socially distant, some in mass, many without. And part of that record that the vice president will be selling here tonight, of course, includes their response to this pandemic. Mike Pence is the leader of the, the administration's coronavirus task force, and he's going to have to explain their response to this pandemic, somehow tout their response. Of course, as we have seen, more than 170,000 Americans die. And while tonight is all about Mike Pence, we can now report that the president is expected to make an appearance here tonight to celebrate these heroes and some of our nation's wounded warriors. Ahead of his George. big speech tomorrow night. Okay, Mary, thanks very much. We have our team here in the studio as well. World News Tonight anchor David Muir. Uh, last time a hurricane disrupted a convention, 2008 Hurricane Gustav, the Republican <laughs> convention in Minnesota. This one bearing down right in the middle of the proceedings. Yeah, it's hard to overstate. Uh, this would be a challenge for any administration during a convention, but that split screen of the Republican National Convention and multiple emergencies unfolding in this country at once, not the least of which is this hurricane. As you know, it's going to be catastrophic in nature. 150 mile per hour winds. You know, as we heard uh, Ginger mention and the words they are using are the storm surge will be unsurvivable. The National Hurricane Center calling this extremely dangerous. Tomorrow night this time, George, you and I are going to be talking about the disaster relief, the federal response that will be necessary in this country from Texas all the way to Louisiana, most importantly, that Lake Charles region. And of course, all of this comes as this country is already strained in a coronavirus pandemic uh, and in a region where we still see these COVID-19 test rates extremely positive.
positive, particularly in, in southwestern Louisiana. They are already strained. Families reporting today that they couldn't get on buses uh, to, to seek shelter in other places because they had family members who had coronavirus. These are disasters converging at once in a, in a large part of this country. That's right. And Lizzie Davis, tomorrow night we will no doubt also be talking about these continuing protests in Wisconsin as well. That extraordinary move today by the NBA after the Bucks boycotted their game, all games called off. That's right. Some irony, I would say, playing out here tonight as Mike Pence has chosen uh, the backdrop of Fort McHenry to give his speech. As you mentioned, this is the location that Francis Scott Key was inspired to write uh, the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, the vice president really showcasing the national anthem tonight. And this is, of course, was front and center in the controversy with the NFL, Colin Kaepernick, and the protest of police brutality in this country. If you remember 2017, when Mike Pence and his wife, they flew to that NFL game intentionally, then planning, and they did. Uh, walk out and leave when uh, some of the players kneeled during the, the playing of the national anthem. And now you have the NBA players doing the same tonight, refusing to play in protest of the shooting of Jacob Blake. Uh, the Major League Baseball team, the Milwaukee Brewers, also not playing tonight. A lot well. of those players wondering why they're even playing at all during these crises. I want to bring in Chris Christie, former Republican governor of Jersey, longtime ally also of President Trump. Does the Trump team have to adjust the convention tonight and tomorrow night in the wake of these crises? Well, I think for tonight, the vice president should probably adjust some of what he's going to be saying tonight to address this head on in the beginning of the speech. I think that would be a smart thing for him to do. As for tomorrow night, we have to see what happens tonight. You know, uh, I've been through something like this, and, and I think the conditions on the ground tomorrow in Texas and Louisiana will dictate what the president needs to do. Um, I think if you announce it before it happens, you look like you're playing politics with it a little bit. Let's see what the result of it is first, and then have the president react to the results. So if the storm is as devastating as David was just describing, then I think the president's going to have to consider making some adjustments tomorrow. And if that's Simpson, I heard some uh, concern from Democrats today that perhaps they're going to see uh, some backlash as these protests continue and some of the Black Lives Matter protesters, some, uh, confront others with violence and intimidation. I want to be clear that, I, that the Black Lives Matter protesters are not condoning violence. It's a very different <laughs> from what you're seeing out here. I mean, these are peaceful protests. These are organized protests. Black Lives Matter um, co-founders do not support this type of violence. But the peaceful protesting that you're seeing is certainly required. If you think about the fact that, one, these officers were not even wearing body cams is what we're hearing, that the only footage we have is of this video. Um, the fact that we still don't know the names of the officer who was involved yet. Uh, and then, of course, we need to talk about the vigilante who came a state over and shot protesters last night. I mean, it is a very, very interesting America. And I think that the RNC would be well served to talk about that. I mean, I, we were talking earlier about whether or not they should. And I I think they definitely should. Uh, and, I, and so they've got two things to talk about. One, they've got to talk about the storm, but I think it would be very tone deaf if they don't talk about what's happening in Wisconsin right now. Rahman Manley, Joe, has Joe Biden been doing enough on all this? He came out with a video today saying he spoke with Jacob Blake's mother, also condemned the violence in the protests. Is that enough? Yeah, I mean, it, well, I don't think this is one subject that you just can say, I've done enough. This goes to a more moral, ethical component. So to say enough would be just in the political context. I do think, Georgia, you're going to look at all this, and the optimal word of the, these two days is storm, not just the one natural in the sense of weather, but what's also a storm brewing. I, what I would say is the players in the Milwaukee Bucks walking off, the game's canceled. When it touches culture and entertainment like that, this thing has flipped, and especially now given that the person that did the shooting is a uh, person from Illinois with a right-wing conservative view that's going to change the way people interpret these events. Sarah Fagel, we'll come to you in a moment. Pence. Now Karen Pence is speaking. 100 years ago today, the 19th Amendment was adopted into the United States Constitution, guaranteeing women the right to vote. Because of heroes like Susan B. Anthony and Lucy Stone, women today, like our daughters, Audrey and Charlotte, and future generations will have their voices heard and their votes count. The women's suffrage movement was the gateway that led to women having the opportunities to achieve monumental milestones and accomplish significant achievements in both civic and governmental roles. This evening, we look at heroes in our land. As second lady of the United States for the past three and a half years, 
I have had the honor of meeting many heroes across this great country. The Pences are a military family. Our son Michael serves in the United States Marines, and our son-in-law Henry serves in the U.S. Navy. And one of my key initiatives is to elevate and encourage military spouses. These men and women, like our daughter Charlotte and our daughter-in-law Sarah, are the home front heroes. I have been privileged to hear so many stories of selfless support, volunteer spirit, and great contributions to the armed forces and our communities. You know, military spouses may experience frequent moves and job changes, periods of being a single parent while their loved one is deployed, all while exhibiting pride, strength, and determination and being a part of something bigger than themselves. To all of the military spouses, thank you. President Trump and Vice President Pence have been supporting our United States Armed Forces, including our military families, on a significant scale. While traveling throughout our nation to educate military spouses about policy solutions that President Trump has promoted involving real, tangible progress in military spouse employment, I have been inspired to meet heroes like Lisa Bradley and Cameron Cruz. These military spouses decided to start their own business, R. Riveter, named after the Rosie the Riveter campaign used to recruit women workers during World War II. R. Riveter makes beautiful handbags designed and manufactured exclusively by military spouses. And many of those spouses live all over the country. They prepare and send their section of the bags to the company located in North Carolina where the final product is assembled. Military spouse hero Jalan Hall Johnson in Billings, Montana, is a culinary artist who had dreamed of starting her own restaurant. Working with the Small Business Administration's Development Center, Jalan started her restaurant, The Sassy Biscuit, and she just opened a second restaurant in Dover, New Hampshire. And as the second lady, I've also been able to bring awareness to a form of therapy for our heroic veterans suffering from PTSD. Art therapy, facilitated by a professional art therapist, is especially effective with post-traumatic stress disorder. Master Gunnery Sergeant Chris Stowe, a Marine veteran I met in Tampa, who deployed for combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, said nothing had helped him deal with the trauma from his service in the Marines until he finally agreed to meet with the art therapist at Walter Reed Medical Center. Chris credits art therapy with saving his marriage and his life. And Chris went on to establish a glass blowing workshop to help other vets. Many of our veteran heroes struggle as they transition back into civilian life, and sometimes the stress is too difficult to manage alone. A few weeks ago, I had the honor of speaking with some amazing Americans who answer the veterans' crisis line. One in particular, Sydney Morgan, especially impacted me. A veteran herself, Sydney said it is the highest honor of her life until they physically walk into a clinic to receive help they deserve and she can pass their hand to someone ready to help. In these difficult times, we've all seen so many examples of everyday Americans reaching out a hand to those in need, those who in humility have considered others more important than themselves. We've seen healthcare workers, teachers, first responders, mental health providers, law enforcement officers, grocery and delivery workers, and farmers, and so many others, heroes all. 100 years ago, women secured the right to vote 
So let's vote America. Let's honor our heroes. Let's reelect President Trump and Vice President Pence for four more years. God bless our heroes and God bless the United States of America. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Good evening, I'm Kellyanne Conway. 100 years ago, courageous warriors helped women secure the right to vote. This has been a century worth celebrating, but also a reminder that our democracy is young and fragile. A woman in a leadership role can still seem novel. Not so for President Trump. For decades, he has elevated women to senior positions in business and in government. He confides in and consults us, respects our opinions, and insists that we are on equal footing with the men. President Trump helped me shatter a barrier in the world of politics by empowering me to manage his campaign to its successful conclusion. With the help of millions of Americans, our team defied the critics, the naysayers, the conventional wisdom, and we won. For many of us, women's empowerment is not a slogan. It comes not from strangers on social media or sanitized language in a corporate handbook. It comes from the everyday heroes who nurture us, who shape us, and who believe in us. I was raised in a household of all women. They were self-reliant and resilient. Their lives were not easy, but they never complained. Money was tight, but we had an abundance of what mattered most, family, faith, and freedom. I learned that in America, limited means does not make for limited dreams. The promise of America belongs to us all. This is a land of inventors and innovators, of entrepreneurs and educators, of pioneers and parents, each contributing to the success and the future of a great nation and her people. These everyday heroes have a champion in President Trump, the teacher who took extra time to help students adjust to months of virtual learning, the nurse who finished a 12-hour COVID shift and then took a brief break only to change her mask, gown, and gloves to do it all over again. The small business owner striving to reopen after the lockdown was lifted and then again after her store was vandalized and looted. The single mom with two kids, two jobs, two commutes who 10 years after that empty promise finally has health insurance. President Trump and Vice President Pence have lifted Americans, provided them with dignity, opportunity, and results. I have seen firsthand many times the president comforting and encouraging a child who has lost a parent, a parent who has lost a child, a worker who lost his job, an adolescent who lost her way to drugs. Don't lose hope, he has told them, assuring them that they are not alone and that they matter. There always will be people who have far more than us. Our responsibility is to focus on those who have far less than us. President Trump has done precisely that in taking unprecedented action to combat this nation's drug crisis. He told me, this is so important, Kellyanne. So many lives have been ruined by addiction and will never even know it because people are ashamed to reach out for help and they're not even sure who to turn to in their toughest hour. Rather than look the other way, President Trump stared directly at this drug crisis next door and through landmark bipartisan legislation has helped secure historic investments in surveillance, interdiction, education, prevention, treatment, and recovery. 
We have a long way to go, but the political inertia that costs lives and the silence and the stigma that prevents people in need from coming forward is melting away. This is the man I know and the president we need for four more years. He picks the toughest fights and tackles the most complex problems. He has stood by me and he will stand up for you. In honor of the women who empowered me and for the future of the children we all cherish, thank you and God bless you always. Kellyanne Conway now leaving the White House in the next month after serving for the first term in President Trump's White House. And I want to bring in Sarah Fagan. So, Sarah, in the last, uh, in this 9 o'clock hour, we've heard from Kelly McEnany, the President's press secretary. We've heard from his senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway. Remarkable who we're not hearing from in this Republican convention. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no Bush in the lineup. Uh, we're not seeing any nominee, previous no nominee uh, speaking. You know, and with respect to the Bushes, you know, somebody I worked closely with, I think it's a real disappointment. Um, the feelings between the men are mutual, so it's not as if President Bush would like to go and defend the Trump record. I don't think he would do that. Um, but I think there are subtle ways for President Trump to acknowledge the Republican Party and the history of the Republican Party. This is a Republican convention. The reality is politics is often an exercise of addition. and. For Trump, who's behind, I think, five to six points, I think he's, he gets undercounted in a lot of polls, but he's behind. He's got to figure out how to make up ground. There is about 12% of this electorate that likes his policy, doesn't like him. But that 12%, they like John McCain, they like President Bush. Uh, President Bush's father passed away, former president, 41, since the last convention. Why not do a video? at least honoring his contribution to the country and the party. There are soft and subtle ways you can be inclusive, and I think this is where President Trump makes a mistake, because he's got to get that piece of the base back to win this election. And Matthew Dodd, thank you, sir. It's one more sign of how President Trump has remade this Republican Party in his own image. Yeah, I was listening to Sarah, and I've watched the convention. Is Do The problem is Donald Trump thinks the Republican Party actually began with him. So acknowledging any people before that might have done a great job actually is di di difficult for him because he thinks, as he stated before, he's been the greatest president, the greatest that. I think the difficulty for the Republican Party, whether or not they win or lose and what happens in the next 70 days or not, the Republican Party didn't, Donald Trump didn't change the Republican Party. The Republican Party changed and therefore Donald Trump became the nominee. And I think that's the part the Republicans are going to have to deal with. There's no room for Jeff Flakes. There's no room for George W. Bushes. There's no room for Bob Doles. There's no room for Mitt Romney's. And so as you look forward, who is the Republican Party? It's not a Donald Trump problem. It's a Republican Party that has fundamentally changed from what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Matt Dowd, thanks. I want to bring in John Carl. John, we just heard Kellyanne Conway there played such a central role in the closing days of the 2016 campaign throughout her time at the White House. This uh, speech tonight is something of a swan song. Uh, yeah, really something else. She is uh, as fierce a loyalist as, as Donald Trump has. The person that would go out there and defend him even when virtually nobody else would. Uh, she was the one early on who coined the, the, the phrase alternative facts, uh, going out there and defending the misstatements in the first uh, days of the, of the Trump White House, even the misstatements on the crowd size of, of his inauguration. Uh, but she is leaving. And I think, George, this is one of those times in Washington where somebody says they are leaving to spend more time with their family, and it's true. Uh, she has four children. Uh, she, her, her husband has famously become one of, uh, one of the harshest Trump critics. Uh, it's obviously caused pain in her family. Uh, he is taking a break from Twitter and from the Lincoln Project, the anti-Trump uh, group. Uh, and this is probably the last time for some time that we will see her in public doing what we have seen her do so many times over the past four years out there defending the president. Okay, John Carl, thanks very much. We're going to return now to the convention floor, at least the convention screen now. We're going to hear in just a moment. Uh, from Lou Holtz, uh, who's been a strong supporter of President Trump. Let's listen in, though, on the, onto the floor. For you. I'm Lou Holtz. Many of you might know me as Coach Holtz, or maybe that football guy. 
It is a pleasure, a blessing, and an honor for me to explain why I believe that President Trump is a consistent winner, an outstanding leader, and deserves to be reelected as our president. First, I want you to know that I grew up in a one-bedroom house in West Virginia. I may have been poor, but the lessons my parents taught me were priceless. They taught me that life is about making choices. Wherever you are, good or bad, don't blame anyone else. Go get an education, get to work. You can overcome any obstacles. And always remember that in this great country of ours, anyone can amount to something special. I lived by those principles of hard work and responsibility my whole life, living out the American story, and it works. But there are people today, like politicians, professors, protesters, and of course, President Trump's naysayers in the media who like to blame others for problems. They don't have pride in our country. And because they no longer ask, what can I do for my country? Only what the country should be doing for them. They don't have pride in themselves. That's wrong. When I was an officer in the Army, I served with so many great Americans who embraced their responsibility to our country. I'm so proud of their sacrifices and the opportunity it has provided for so many millions. America remains a land of opportunity, no matter what the other side says or believes. You know, there's a statue of me at Notre Dame. I guess they needed a place for the pigeons to land. But if you look closely, you will see these three words there, trust, commitment, and love. All my life, I've made my choices based on these three words. I use these three rules to make choices about everything. My beloved wife of 59 years, athletes I coached, and of course, politicians, even President Trump. I ask myself three things. One, can I trust them? When a leader tells you something, you got to be able to count on it. That's President Trump. He says what he means, he means what he says. And he's done what he said he would do at every single turn. One of the important reasons he has my trust is because nobody has been a stronger advocate for the unborn than President Trump. The Biden-Harris ticket is the most radically pro-abortion campaign in history. They and other politicians are Catholics in name only and abandon innocent lives. President Trump protects those lives. I trust President Trump. The second question I ask is, are they committed to doing their very best? President Trump always finds a way to get something done. If you want to do something bad enough, you will find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. And excuses are a lot easier to find than solutions. President Trump finds solutions. President Trump is committed. And the third question I ask is, do they love people? Do they care about others? To me, this is very clear. President Trump has demonstrated through his prison reform, advocating for school choice and welfare reform, that he wants Americans from all walks of life to have the opportunity to succeed and live the American dream. President Trump loves our country and our great people. Trust, commitment, and love. In President Trump, we have a president we can trust, who works hard at making America greater, and who genuinely cares about people. If I apply this test to Joe Biden, I can't say yes to any of these three questions. I used to ask our athletes at Notre Dame, if you did not show up, who would miss you and why? Can you imagine what would happen to us if President Trump had not shown up in 2016 to run for president? I'm so glad he showed up. Thank you for showing up, Mr. President. I encourage everyone who loves this country, who loves America, to show up in November for President Trump. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Michael McHale, but my friends call me Mick. I'm a 30-year active duty member of law enforcement in the state of Florida. I am also the president of the National Association of Police Organizations, NAPO. Our organization recently endorsed Donald Trump for re-election as president of the United States. Our endorsement recognized his strong support for the men and women on the front lines, particularly during these challenging times. We value his support of aggressive federal prosecution of those who attack our police officers. His signing of the Law Enforcement Mental Health and Wellness Act and his support for permanently authorizing funds to support 9-11 first responders and their families. Law enforcement officers across the nation take an oath to run towards danger when everyone else is running away. They do so willingly to protect our families and communities. I'm proud that the overwhelming majority of American police officers are the best of the best and put their lives on the line without hesitation. And good officers need to know their elected leaders and the department brass have their backs. Unfortunately, chaos results when failed officials in cities like Portland, Minneapolis, Chicago, and New York make the conscious decision not to support law enforcement. Shootings, murders, looting, and rioting occur unabated. The violence and bloodshed we are seeing in these and other cities isn't happening by chance. It's the direct result of refusing to allow law enforcement to protect our communities. Joe Biden has turned his candidacy over to the far left anti-law enforcement radicals. And as a senator, Kamala Harris pushed to further restrict police cut their training and make our American communities and streets even more dangerous than they already are. Conversely, President Trump supports the creation of a national standard for training on de-escalation and communication to give officers more tools to resolve conflict without violence. The differences between Trump, Pence, and Biden-Harris are crystal clear. Your choices are the most pro-law enforcement president we've ever had, or the most radical anti-police ticket in history. We invite those who value the safety of their family and loved ones to join the hundreds of thousands of members of the National Association of Police Organizations and support the re-election of President Donald J. Trump. Thank you, and God bless America. Important endorsement there for President Trump. Mike Pence is coming up later in the evening. We'll be right back.
The Republican National Convention. Here again, George Stephanopoulos. Back now in night three, the Republican Convention, of course, is coming against the backdrop of protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. I want to bring in Terry Moran for more on this. And Terry, as we've seen basically since George Floyd was shot on Memorial Day, these Black Lives Matter protests and the reaction of those protests has become one of the biggest X factors in this election. It is, George. It and the pandemic are the two big issues in this election, really. And once again, as has happened before, the country is going to have to reckon with the demands that black Americans have been made, been making for centuries for justice and equality, true equality, and balance that against the overflow of anger, anguish, and violence in the cities. I think the Republicans have had the advantage on that in past elections, certainly 1968. But this has changed everything. We see the police violence now. Now, and I think the American people are, feel differently about it. Terry Moran, thanks very much. We're now going to hear from Madison Cawthorn, Republican candidate for Congress in North Carolina. If he gets elected, he'll be the youngest member of Congress, one of the youngest members ever elected to Congress. He was paralyzed in an auto accident. And I'm running to represent North Carolina's 11th congressional district. This is a time of great adversity for our country. And I know something about adversity. At 18 years old, I was in a horrific car accident that's left me paralyzed from the waist down. Instantly, my hopes and dreams were seemingly destroyed. I was given a 1% chance of surviving. But thanks to the power of prayer, a very loving community and many skilled doctors, I made it. It took me over a year to recover. My first public outing in a wheelchair was to a professional baseball game. You know, before my accident, I was six foot three. I stood out in a crowd. But as I wheeled through the stadium, I felt invisible. At 20, I thought about giving up. However, I knew I could still make a difference. You know, my accident has given me new eyes to see and new ears to hear. God protected my mind and my ability to speak. So I say to people who feel forgotten, ignored and invisible, I see you, I hear you. At 20, I made a choice. In 2020, our country has a choice. We can give up on the American idea or we can work together to make our imperfect union more perfect. I choose to fight for the future, to seize the high ground and retake the shining city on a hill. While the radical left wants to dismantle, defund and destroy, Republicans under President Trump's leadership want to rebuild, restore and renew. I just turned 25. When I'm elected this November, I'll be the youngest member of Congress in over 200 years. And if you don't think young people can change the world, then you just don't know American history. George Washington was 21 when he received his first military commission. Abe Lincoln, 22 when he first ran for office. And my personal favorite, James Madison, was just 25 years old when he signed the Declaration of Independence. In times of peril, Young people have stepped up and saved this country, abroad and at home. We held the line, scaled the cliffs, crossed oceans, liberated camps, and cracked codes. Yet today, political forces want to usher in the digital dark ages, a time of information without wisdom and tribalism without truth. National leaders on the left have normalized emotion-based voting and a radicalized identity politics that rejects Martin Luther King's dream. MLK's dream is our dream. For all Americans to be judged solely on their character. Millions of people risk their lives every year to come here because they believe in the dream of MLK and the American dream. Join us as we, the party of freedom, double down on ensuring the American dream for all people. We are committed to building a new town square. It welcomes all ideas and all people. Here we will have freedom of speech, not freedom from speech. To liberals, I say let's have a conversation. Be a true liberal. Listen to other ideas and let the best ones prevail. And to conservatives, I say let's define what we support and win the argument in areas like healthcare and on the environment. In this new town square, you don't have to apologize for your beliefs or cower to a mob. You can kneel before God, but stand for our flag. The American idea my ancestors fought for during the Revolutionary War is just as exciting and revolutionary today as it was 250 years ago. I say to Americans who love our country, young and old, 
be a radical for freedom. Be a radical for liberty. And be a radical for our republic, for which I stand, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and may God bless America. Powerful moment there for Madison Cawthorn. He actually defeated a Trump-endorsed candidate in the primary, as he said he would be the youngest member of Congress if elected in almost 200 years. I'm Jack Brewer, a former three-time NFL team captain, college professor, coach, husband, son, and father. I'm also a lifelong Democrat, but I support Donald Trump. Let me be clear, I didn't come here for the popularity or the praise, the likes or the retweets. I'm here as a servant to God, a servant to the people of our nation, and a servant to our president. I grew up in Gravon, Texas, a town that my great-grandfather was the first black man to settle as a sharecropper in 1896. My early high school experience included fighting with skinheads and being in witness in an attempted murder trial after my friend shot a skinhead in self-defense. I remember my dad's bravery when he personally stood up against a KKK rally in my town. In my house, my father taught me to back down from no one. I know what racism looks like. I've seen it firsthand. In America, it has no resemblance to President Trump. And I'm fed up with the way he's portrayed in the media, who refuse to acknowledge what he's actually done for the black community. It's confusing the minds of our innocent children. Before I left to come deliver this message, my energetic eight-year-old son Jackson stopped me and said, Dad, can you please just tell everyone that all lives need to matter and that God loves everyone? In that moment, I realized that my eight-year-old had figured out what so many adults have seemed to forget. We are not as divided as our politics suggest. At some point, for the sake of our children, the policies must take priority over the personalities. So because you have an issue with President Trump's tone, you're going to allow Biden and Harris to, to deny our underserved black and brown children school choice? Are we so offended by the president's campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, that we're going to ignore that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have collectively been responsible for locking up countless black men for nonviolent crimes? Are you going to allow the media to lie to you by falsely claiming that he said there were very fine white supremacists in Charlottesville? He didn't say that. It's a lie and ignore the so-called Black Lives Matter organization that openly, on their website, calls for the destruction of the nuclear family. My fellow Americans, our families need each other. We need black fathers in the homes with their wives and children. The future of our communities depend on it. I'm blessed to be able to run inner city youth programs and to also teach in prisons across America. The inmates in my federal prison program literally received days off their sentence just for attending my class. And that's thanks to President Donald Trump and his first step back. President Trump cared about these Americans and their families, even when so many others had left them behind and had written them off. I'm forever grateful for President Trump for that. He endures relentless attacks, and so do many of us, like myself, who support him. But my mom always told me, when the Lord starts blessing, the devil starts messing. This convention marks a time to celebrate our history. Republicans are the party that freed the slaves and the party that put the first black men and women in Congress. It's the party of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, and now Tim Scott and Donald Trump. Our president has made incredible strides to end mass incarceration and give unprecedented opportunities for black in America to rise. America, let this election be a call for all God's people who are called by his name to humble ourselves and pray together and to seek his face and to turn from our wicked ways 
then he will hear us from heaven and he will forgive our sins and he will heal our land. Amen. And God bless America. Jack Brewer speaking there for President Trump says he's a Democrat, former NFL player. We should also note that in August he was cited by the SEC for insider trading. We're going to take another quick break. Senator Joni Ernst is coming up. Back now with night three of the Republican National Convention, and Mike Pence, Vice President Mike Pence, the big headliner tonight. I want to bring in Chris Christie for more on this. You know, ever since he was chosen to be the running mate back in 2016, the only daylight he showed from Donald Trump was that Access Hollywood weekend for several hours where he went, went kind of dark. Ever since then, been in lockstep with the president. How does he set the stage for the president's big speech tomorrow night? Well, listen, <clears throat> I think Mike Pence does 
what Mike Pence does well, which is he will talk about meat and potatoes type of issues um, and Midwestern type of issues. He'll talk values. Um, and, and I think he will address the COVID crisis as the... Well, he has to. Yeah, right, as the head of the task force. He will do that um, head on. And I think what he wants to do is try to kind of lay out the issue boxes for the president then to come in and say, here's how we solve them. And I think that's the way Pence's speech will go tonight. Okay, I want to bring in Rahm Emanuel also. Senator Joni Ernst, uh, who's up for re-election in Iowa, is about to speak in just a couple of minutes. I was talking earlier to Sarah Fagan about who's not here tonight. She is also one of the few Republicans who's in a, in a race this year who's actually showing up at this convention. Well, Iowa is, should be safe real estate. Actually, based on polling I saw today, this is a battle, uh, slowly but surely moving into a battleground status if the race stays at this point. She needs Trump's backing to get a big Republican can turn out because she has lost, and this is a classic case in Iowa, she's lost the independents. The independents are gone from the Republican Party. So she needs a base turnout election, and that's why she's hugging Donald Trump. And that's a, Sarah, again, he's, she's, she's standing alone right there. Cory Gardner from Colorado. I hear Tom Tillis, North Carolina, not coming to the convention. Well, I think all of the Republicans, Flake and others who have uh, endorsed Joe Biden, are making a mistake for the long-term health of the Republican Party. If you think Donald Trump is going to lose, which I don't accept necessarily, um, we need a Republican Senate. We need Donald Trump to do very well in this election. If Donald Trump gets 45% of the vote, it is going to be a very ugly night. And so a lot of Republicans look at this. They like Trump's policies. Maybe they don't like him. They're, many are with him. Most of the party is with him. Obviously, he's getting almost 90% of the Republican vote. But that 10% that's not with him needs to think about the U.S. Senate. And John Carl, let me bring you in on this. You also uh, have, worked, have covered Mitch McConnell closely for many years. How frustrated are they now by the fact that, the, that there is no deal on this coronavirus, the next stage of the coronavirus relief package, which presumably a lot of those uh, incumbents who are running for your election could use? Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a major frustration. They know this is going to be a, a central issue in the, in the campaign going forward in the midterm elections, and there's just no movement whatsoever on it, George. And, and President Trump, how active do you expect him to be in these campaigns in the final weeks? Well, I, I think he will be out there. If you looked at what he did as a roadmap in the midterms, which did not go well uh, uh, for, you know, in the 2018 midterms, uh, the president did go out there in a number of Senate races, uh, did have some success, and in some of the gubernatorial races, uh, was not really involved whatsoever uh, with, with the House races. Uh, but I expect that, that he will be out there, and I also expect there will be some states where they would rather uh, uh, he not be on the campaign trail with their candidates. Okay, John Carl, thanks very much. We're going to go back to the virtual convention. Floor video is wrapping up right now, and then we will hear from Senator Joni Ernst. President, we've never had and never will have, I believe. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me into your home this evening. It's truly a privilege. My name is Joni Ernst. I was raised on a small family farm here in Iowa where I learned the importance of faith, hard work, and service. I worked my way through college, then dedicated my life to serving my country as a local official, a battalion commander in the military, and as a U.S. Senator. Service, it's more than a word to me. It's a mission, a way of life. It's what brought me to Cedar Rapids, Iowa in 2008 when I was in the National Guard. We saw historic floods that swept through the communities. We lent a helping hand to our fellow Iowans who were literally underwater. We thought we had seen the worst, but 12 years later, these same communities have faced an even more devastating disaster, the recent derecho storm. If you don't live in Iowa, you may not have heard much about it at first. While reporters here in the state were in the trenches covering the equivalent of a Category 2 hurricane, most of the national media looked the other way. To them, Iowa is still just flyover country. Houses, farms were destroyed. About one-third of our crops here were damaged. In some cases, these storms wiped out a lifetime of work.
And yet Iowa farmers didn't hesitate to grab their chainsaws and check on their neighbors. Our farmers live every day with that sense of service, the stewards of the land, the ones who feed and fuel the world. President Trump quickly signed an emergency declaration for Iowa to provide relief. And of course, when President Trump came to Cedar Rapids, the national media finally did too. For years, I've worked closely with the president for farmers in Iowa and across the country. We scrapped Obama and Biden's punishing waters of the United States rule, which would have regulated about 97% of land in Iowa, in some cases, even puddles. It would have been a nightmare for farmers. The president delivered on major trade deals with Japan and the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. And he implemented the sale of E15 fuel year-round. That means more choices for you at the pump and more jobs for farmers in the heartland. This is something the Obama-Biden administration failed to do in eight years. In fact, I can't recall an administration more hostile to farmers than Obama-Biden, unless you count the Biden-Harris ticket. The Democratic Party of Joe Biden is pushing this so-called Green New Deal. If given power, they would essentially ban animal agriculture and eliminate gas-powered cars. It would destroy the agriculture industry, not just here in Iowa, but throughout the country. When the pandemic hit, President Trump heard us in our call for assistance for our farmers. Knowing we have an ally in the White House is important. Folks, this election is a choice between two very different paths, freedom, prosperity, and economic growth under a Trump-Pence administration, or the Biden-Harris path, paved by liberal coastal elites and radical environmentalists, an America where farmers are punished, jobs are destroyed, and taxes crush the middle class. That is our choice and it's a clear one. Thank you, and God bless. Senator Joni Ernst right there. We're heading into the primetime hour right now. Vice President Mike Pence will be the headliner, and we'll be right back. This is an ABC News special. It's on. An ardent defender. This election has never been clear. And a loyal lieutenant. Now is the time. This is the moment for each of us to do everything that we can in our power to reelect this president. Tonight, Vice President Mike Pence defends the ticket and makes his case for four more years. Live from New York City and across the country, the Republican National Convention. Now reporting, Chief Anchor George Stephanopoulos. Good evening and welcome to night three of the Republican National Convention. The headliner tonight, Vice President Mike Pence from Fort McHenry in Baltimore, the site of the battle that inspired Francis Scott Key to write the poem that became our national anthem. A night of pageantry and politics that collides with breaking news on our shores and in our streets. Protests continue for the third night in Wisconsin after the shooting of Jacob Blake in the back by police.
A young vigilante who took up a rifle to confront Black Lives Matter's protesters there has now been arrested for shooting three. Two of the victims are dead. And in an extraordinary move, the NBA has postponed tonight's playoff games after the Milwaukee Bucks boycotted their game to protest the shooting of Blake. The WNBA, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer have also postponed their games tonight. Meantime, Hurricane Laura is bearing down on the Louisiana-Texas border, now a fierce Category 4 storm set to be one of the strongest storms ever to make landfall in the United States. So let's get the latest from Ginger Z in Port Arthur. Ginger, we spoke to you an hour ago. I can see the wind is kicking up right now. We are just about to get in the main shield of what is Hurricane Laura. That Category 4 storm, now the center of it, is about 90 miles to my southeast. And you can see it making a beeline for the southwestern Louisiana coast right along this Texas state line. So I want to take you through this forecast quickly. Unsurvivable storm surge and significant wind. We're talking an excess of 100 miles per hour for hours, right? We'll see landfall at about 1 a.m. central time here. But look at Lake Charles at 6 a.m. It's still blowing at 127 miles per hour. Then it moves up Shreveport. You'll see very strong winds with this too. I think we're going to see power outages, George, all the way up through Arkansas. Obviously, at it started, I'm most concerned about that storm surge, though, 10 to 20 feet. Huge storm category for Ginger. I know you're going to be covering it all through the night. Stay safe out there. In the meantime, I want to bring in Mary Bruce. She's at Fort McHenry in Baltimore. And Mary, another extraordinary setting for this unusual convention. George here at the birthplace of the Star Spangled Banner. The vice president tonight is expected to make his case. This is a night that is all about celebrating American heroes. You can see behind me the crowd of about 100 of the president's supporters, including veterans, first responders, uh, many Medal of Honor recipients. They are somewhat socially distant, some in mass, many without. And here in just a short time, Mike Pence will have to take to the stage, and he is expected to sell the president's record, outlining his vision for the next four years. He is also also expected to take on Joe Biden. He's going to outline in stark terms what is at stake in this election, saying the choice in this election is whether America remains America. And we have learned that he is making some late tweaks to this speech. He is expected at least to make a passing reference to the unrest tonight in Wisconsin, George. One of the adjustments in the wake of these events, these extraordinary events unfolding as this convention unfolds as well. We're about to hear from another member of the Trump family, Lara Trump, his daughter-in-law married to Eric Trump. She's been working on the campaign. Let's listen in. Good evening, America. I'm Lara Trump, daughter of Bob and Linda Unaska, sister to Kyle, mother to Luke and Carolina, and the daughter-in-law of our 45th president, Donald J. Trump. But tonight, I come to you simply as an American. My life began like many in our country. I grew up in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. My parents were small business owners and worked hard to make sure that my brother and I had everything we needed, but not everything we wanted. My parents raised me to believe that in America, I could achieve anything with hard work and determination, that the opportunities available to me were limited only by the size of my ambition, that I should dream big, and I did. Those very dreams are what led me to New York City. I'd heard the adage, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere, and I intended to do just that. Never in a million years did I think that I would be on this stage tonight, and I certainly never thought that I'd end up with the last name Trump. My seventh grade English teacher, Mrs. B, used to tell us, believe none of what you hear, half of what you read, and only what you're there to witness firsthand. The meaning of those words never fully weighed on me until I met my husband and the Trump family. Any preconceived notion I had of this family disappeared immediately. They were warm and caring. They were hard workers, and they were down to earth. They reminded me of my own family. They made me feel like I was home. Walking the halls of the Trump Organization, I saw the same family environment. I also saw the countless women executives who thrived there year after year. Gender didn't matter. What mattered was the ability to get the job done. I learned this directly when, in 2016, my father-in-law asked me to help him win my cherished home state and my daughter's namesake, North Carolina. Though I had no political experience, he believed in me. He knew I was capable, even if I didn't. 
So it didn't surprise me when President Donald Trump appointed so many women to senior level positions in his administration. Secretary of the United Nations, Secretary of the Air Force, the first female CIA director, the first black female director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and countless ambassadors, just to name a few. Under President Trump's leadership, women's unemployment hit the lowest level since World War II. 4.3 million new jobs have been created for women. In 2019 alone, women took over 70% of all new jobs. Female small business ownership remains at an all-time high, and 600,000 women have been lifted out of poverty, all since President Trump took office. He didn't do these things to gain a vote or check a box. He did them because they're the right things to do. 100 years ago today, the 19th Amendment was ratified, granting the right to vote to every American woman. And since that day, incredible strides have been made by women in America. From Amelia Earhart to Rosa Parks and Sally Ride, women shaped our history and are part of what has made our country the most exceptional nation in the world. I often think back to my 24-year-old self driving alone in my car from North Carolina to New York City. And I think about what I'd tell myself now as we head towards the most critical election in modern history. This is not just a choice between Republican and Democrat or left and right. This is an election that will decide if we keep America America or if we head down an uncharted, frightening path towards socialism. Abraham Lincoln once famously said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. While those words were spoken over 150 years ago, never have they been more relevant. Will we choose the right path and maintain the unique freedoms and boundless opportunities that make this country the greatest in the history of the world? Will we remain the beacon of hope for those around the world fighting oppression, communism, and tyranny? The choice is ours. I know the promise of America because I've lived it, not just as a member of the Trump family, but as a woman who knows what it's like to work in blue-collar jobs, to serve customers for tips, and to aspire to rise. When I look at my son Luke and my daughter Carolina, I wonder, what sort of country will I be leaving for them? for our future generations. In recent months, we've seen weak, spineless politicians seek control of our great American cities to violent mobs. Defund the police is the rallying cry for the new radical Democrat party. Joe Biden will not do what it takes to maintain order, to keep our children safe in our neighborhoods and in their schools, to restore our American way of life. We cannot dare to dream our biggest dreams for ourselves or for our children while consumed by worry about the safety of our families. President Trump is the law and order president, from our borders to our backyards. President Trump will keep America safe. President Trump will keep America prosperous. President Trump will keep America, America. If you're watching tonight and wrestling with your vote on November 3rd, I implore you, tune out the distorted news and biased commentary and hear it straight from someone who knows. I wasn't born a Trump. I'm from the South. I was raised a Carolina girl. I went to public schools and worked my way through a state university. Mrs. B from my seventh grade English class was right. What I learned about our president is different than what you might have heard. I learned that he's a good man, that he loves his family, that he didn't need this job, that no one on earth works harder for the American people, that he's willing to fight for his beliefs and for the people and the country that he loves. He is a person of conviction. He is a fighter and will never stop fighting for America. He will uphold our values. He will preserve our families. And he will build upon the great American edict that our union will never be perfect until opportunity is equal for all including and especially for women. Our 40th president, Ronald Reagan, said it best, the dreams of people may differ, but everybody wants their dreams to come true. And America above all places gives us the freedom to do that. 
It's up to us to keep this country a place where no dream is out of reach for our children and generations beyond. To my father-in-law, thank you for believing in me. Thank you for bravely leading this country and thank you for continuing to fight every day for America. May God bless and protect the Gulf states in the path of the hurricane. May God bless our troops and may God continue to bless this incredible country. Lara Trump right there becoming the fifth member of the Trump family to speak at this convention so far. Like her husband Eric, her brother-in-law Don Jr., sister-in-law Tiffany Trump, a speech both personal and political. Some hard edges right there. Attacks on the media, also attacks on Joe Biden, which she called the radical left. We should point out uh, that Joe Biden has come out against defunding the police. He's never supported the defunding the police movement. David Muir here in the studio with us as well. One other thing, we did hear a line there about those in the path of this category for, for hurricane. This is now the third Republican convention, Gustav in 2008, Isaac in 2012, beset by a hurricane. Yeah, it's really hard, George, to overstate what's happening in this sort of split screen with the convention happening right now. And this would be a challenge really for any administration, given the number of emergencies, uh, flashpoints unfolding in America all at once. But you heard her say, God bless the people in the path of the hurricane. We do have a category for hurricane, as Ginger said at the top of the hour. It's been described as unsurvivable storm surge, extremely dangerous by the National Hurricane Center. Uh, I remember standing in the convention center in New Orleans 15 years ago for Katrina. It reached five out over the Gulf. Was a category three, though, when it made landfall. And just look at the damage in the wake of Katrina. This is a cat four bearing down from parts of Texas all the way to Louisiana tonight. And this time tomorrow, George, you and I are going to be talking about the, the federal relief aid that's necessary. And of course, it comes at a time when the federal government already strained in its reaction to the pandemic. And this is a part of the country that's been hit very hard by COVID. They sure have. Lindsay Davis here as well. Well, we're also tomorrow night going to be talking about these continuing protests in Wisconsin and this extraordinary display of solidarity by the National Sports Leagues, the NBA, WNBA, Major League Baseball now all postponing their games. That's right. Earlier tonight, we heard from Kellyanne Conway, who brought us the alternative facts, and it feels like we're really watching two alternate realities playing out. Just in a little bit, we're going to hear from uh, Vice President Mike Pence, who's really going to be showcasing uh, the national anthem. Earlier tonight, we heard from Madison Cawthorn, who said, Neil before God, but stand for our flag. And now you have uh, the NBA, WNBA, several teams from uh, Major League Soccer, Major League Baseball, who are all essentially taking a collective knee. We did hear from President Obama, who tweeted tonight, I commend the players on the Bucks for standing up for what they believe in. Coaches like Doc Rivers and the NBA and WNBA for setting an example. It's going to take all of our institutions to stand up for our values. This is something that we haven't heard about yet, as far as the protests of, of Jacob Blake, the shooting of him. Uh, but perhaps we will soon tonight at the okay, RNC. Thank you, Lindsay. Chris Christie, how much more adjustment does this convention have to make, if any? Well, I think it'll have to make some, as I said earlier, um, based upon what happens in Louisiana, Texas tonight. This is going to happen overnight. Um, I think the president should be considering options for tomorrow uh, in terms of does he go to the site tomorrow? Does he go to Louisiana, Texas? Is it safe for him to go there? Um, should he do that during the day rather than stay in Washington, D.C.? Does he make an adjustment to the speech tomorrow night? All those things should be in play. Okay, Chris Christie, thanks very much. We're going to go now. Clarence Henderson, he was part of the Woolworth uh, boycott sit-in back in 1960. Conservative now does not support the Black Lives Matter movement, does support Donald Trump. Sixty years ago, segregation was legal and in force. The simple act of sitting at a lunch counter could lead to physical harm, jail time, or worse. I know from personal experience Walking into the Woolworth department store on February 2nd, 1960, I knew it was unlike any day I'd experienced before. My friends had been denied service the day before because of the color of their skin. We knew it wasn't right. But when we went back the next day, I didn't know whether I was going to come out in a vertical or prone position, in handcuffs or on a stretcher, or even in a body bag. By sitting down to order a cup of coffee, we challenged injustice. We knew it was necessary, but we didn't know what would happen. We faced down the KKK. We were cursed at and called all kinds of names. They threatened to kill us, and some of us were arrested, but it was worth it. 
Our actions inspired similar protests throughout the South against racial injustice. And in the end, segregation was abolished, and our country moved a step closer to true equality for all. That's what actual peaceful protests can accomplish. America isn't perfect. We're always improving. But the great thing about this country is that it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. I was born on what some would call the wrong side of the tracks. I don't even have a birth certificate. I never attended an integrated school and am the only one out of my immediate family who graduated from college, an HBCU. I'm a military veteran and a civil rights activist. And you know what else? I'm a Republican and I support Donald Trump. If that sounds strange, you don't know your history. It was the Republican Party that passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery. It was a Republican Party that passed the 14th Amendment, giving black men citizenship. It was a Republican Party that passed the 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote. Freedom of thought is a powerful thing. There are Americans, voters all over the country, who media is trying to convince to conform to the same old Democratic talking points. You know what that'll get you? The same old results. Joe Biden had the audacity to say, if you don't vote for him, you ain't black. Well, to that, I say, if you do vote for Biden, you don't know history. Donald Trump is not a politician. He's a leader. Politicians are a dime a dozen. Leaders are priceless. The record funding Trump gave HBCUs is priceless, too. So are the record number of jobs he created for the black community and the investment he drove into our neighborhoods with tax incentives and opportunity zones. And so are the lives he restored by passing criminal justice reform, where 91% of the inmates released are black. These achievements demonstrate that Donald Trump truly cares about black lives. His policies show his heart. He has done more for black Americans in four years than Joe Biden has done in 50. Donald Trump is offering real and lasting change, an unprecedented opportunity to, to rise, a country that embraces the spirit of the civil rights movement of the 60s, a place where people are judged by the content of their character, their talents and abilities, not by the color of their skin. This is the America I was fighting for 60 years ago. This is the America Donald Trump is fighting for today. Let's all join in this fight for re-electing President Trump on November 3rd. Thank you. Clarence Henderson, Mike Pence is coming up. We'll be right back. Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore the action, the adventure, and the originals. There's no limit to what you'll
back now with night three of the Republican convention. Mike Pence is coming up. We have a little time with our team right now, though, and I want to bring in Rahm Emanuel, picking up on what Chris Christie was saying a few minutes ago, that the White House is going to have to consider adjusting their plans to, because of this hurricane. We've just confirmed our White House team that the White House is indeed considering adjusting those plans, including possibly delaying the speech. This hurricane, one of those external events that can alter an election. Oh, without a doubt. If you go to history, 1992, Hurricane Andrew uh, in Florida, it was a time in which people realized that George Bush 41 wasn't really focused at home given the war. 2005, Katrina in New Orleans changed into actually the midterm. the midterm election and for the 2006 when Nancy Pelosi then became the first speaker. So hurricanes and more than hurricanes, whether you show compassion, effectiveness in governing. One of the big challenges given COVID was the fact that people realized that this president wasn't up to the job in the sense of managing. It's one of the cases that Biden's making right now. I handled the Recovery Act. I managed that process. So if they don't handle this, and I would also say not only this, but the outside events are impacting the inter internal rhetoric at this convention. You have what's going on in Wisconsin, around the country. You have what's going down in Texas and Louisiana. Outside events are buffering the interplay or the lack thereof. If they don't handle this, because it has an intensity moment, the microscope will show real problems. That goes both ways, Yvette Simpson, and I wonder on the protests and the reaction to the protests. There's, I've, I've talked to some Democrats concerned that Joe Biden isn't doing enough to speak out. He did put out that video today speaking out on behalf of the family, the Blake family, but also against the violence. A lot of Democrats worried about this, thinking he should do more. Well, I mean, he immediately said there should be an investigation, and I think we all agree to that. I think he's riding a line, right? Uh, and I don't know that he has to do that here. We have to remember that this isn't the first time we've seen this. George Floyd really opened up, I think, an op opportunity for us to have these conversations about what we're seeing. Let's remember, this was videotaped. We watched that police stalk this young man around the car and actually hold him in place while he was shot. And so I'm not sure why Biden feels like he has to be timid here. And I think hopefully what we're seeing in the outcry with some of our sport teams and certainly our entertainers will give him the latitude to be able to say, look, how much of this will we take? How much must we take? We must do something immediately. And so I think that President Obama stepping up and being forthright, being very clear in what he expected. I hope we'll give Joe Biden an opportunity to do the same. That's okay, right. let me bring in Sarah Fagan for more uh, on what's happening tonight, where, as I said, we're going to hear from Mike Pence. Usually the Wednesday nights of the convention, the time reserved for former presidents to come out and speak. That's not going to happen here. No, there's no President Bush. In fact, there's no Bush at this convention. Uh, Mitt Romney will not be here. Um, look, there's no question, this is Donald Trump's Republican Party. Um, but politics is often an exercise in addition. And certainly winning a campaign requires you to reach out to other people. And we're in a place now where Donald Trump is behind. He's behind a few points, five or six points probably. And there's about 12% of the electorate are soft Republicans. They like Donald Trump's policies. They don't like him. But guess who they do like? They like President Bush. They like Mitt Romney. And he's going to have to appeal to that piece of the Republican Party. And I think, look, we've had two uh, Republican nominees, one president, who've passed away since the last convention. I know he, he, the president, has a longstanding feud with the McCain family. But why not do a video honoring their service to the country? That's a subtle way to be inclusive and acknowledge the Republican Party is a diverse party. And yes, the party's policy and platform has evolved, but there's still history. Sarah Fagan, thanks very much. Mike Pence is coming up. We'll be right back. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it streaming everywhere right to you. Let me speak, ancestors, of the great warrior Mulan.
The Republican National Convention. Here again, George Stephanopoulos. Back now with night three, Mike Pence is coming up. First, I want to bring in our chief national correspondent, Terry Moran, senior national correspondent, for more on what we're seeing now in the streets. And, and Terry, if you listen to the Democratic convention last week, if you listen to the Republican convention this week, if you watch what's happening in Kenosha and across the country, it's pretty clear that both sides are betting on people are going to have very different reactions to what they're seeing in the streets. Very different reactions. The, the Democrats believe that the justice of the cry that Black Lives Matter, especially in the era of social media, when we see police violence, so many people will resonate and build their cause. And the Republicans go into the playbook of law and order. I, I do think that there's a kind of vast, muddled middle in the middle of the country that believes that we can do better on race, a lot better, but would like it to be done orderly and are frightened when they see cities on fire. And so, you know, how how it plays, we're going to learn a lot about our country. Yeah, it is a huge X factor right now. Let me bring in our chief White House correspondent, John Carl. John, let's look ahead to Mike Pence now. He's going to be out here in a couple of minutes. You know, ever since he was picked by Donald Trump to be his running mate back in 2016, with the exception of that Saturday afternoon after the Access Hollywood tape, there has been no daylight between these two men. Mike Pence has had a clear approach to being Donald Trump's running mate and his vice president. That is, praise him at every turn. If you disagree with him or don't like something he has said, keep your mouth shut. That has been Mike Pence's uh, loyal approach, a true loyalist. I cannot point you to a, a hint of a criticism of the boss, even through some of the darkest moments of, of the Trump presidency. Now, that said, George, this is a very interesting speech tonight. It is the only speech at this convention tonight that is live. And you have heard no reference to the violence in Kenosha, to the, sh to the police shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, you've heard nobody at this convention talk about this. Mike Pence has an opportunity opportunity uh, uh, to address that issue. Now, he is speaking, uh, of, of course, at Fort McHenry, uh, the inspiration for, this, for the Star Spangled Banner, uh, an implicit criticism of those uh, that have kneeled in protest. He's about to come up. Let's listen in. Please welcome the Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, accompanied by the second lady, Mrs. Karen Pence. Fort McHenry in Baltimore. A site cho chosen of necessity, of course, this, this convention was originally supposed to be in Charlotte, North Carolina, then Jacksonville, Florida. The pandemic changed all that. Quite a majestic site. Good evening, America. It's an honor to speak to you tonight from the hallowed, from the hallowed grounds of Fort McHenry, the site of the very battle that inspired the words of our national anthem. Those words have inspired this land of heroes in every generation since. It was on this site 206 years ago when our young republic heroically withstood a ferocious naval bombardment from the most powerful empire on earth. They came to crush our revolution, to divide our nation, and to end the American experiment. The heroes who held this fort took their stand for life, liberty, freedom, and the American flag. And those ideals have defined our nation. But they were hardly ever mentioned at last week's Democratic National Convention. Instead, Democrats spent four days attacking America. Joe Biden said that we were living through a season of darkness. But as President Trump said, where Joe Biden sees American darkness, we see American greatness. Yeah. 
In these challenging times, our country needs a president who believes in America, who believes in the boundless capacity of the American people to meet any challenge, defeat any foe, and defend the freedoms we hold dear. America needs four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. Before I go further, allow me to say a word to the families and communities in the path of Hurricane Laura. Our prayers are with you tonight. And our administration is working closely with authorities in the states that will be impacted. FEMA has mobilized resources and supplies for those in harm's way. This is a serious storm. And we urge all those in the affected areas to heed state and local authorities. Stay safe and know that we'll be with you every step of the way to support, rescue, respond, and recover in the days and weeks ahead. That's what Americans do. Four years ago, I answered the call to join this ticket because I knew that Donald Trump had the leadership and the vision to make America great again. And for the last four years, I've watched this president endure unrelenting attacks, but get up every day and fight to keep the promises that he made to the American people. So with gratitude for the confidence President Donald Trump has placed in me, the support of our Republican Party, and the grace of God, I humbly accept your nomination to run and serve as Vice President of the United States. Serving the American people in this office has been a journey I never expected. It's a journey that would not have been possible without the support of my family, beginning with my wonderful wife, Karen. She's a lifelong school teacher, an incredible mother to our three children. And she is one outstanding second lady of the United States. I'm so proud of you. And we couldn't be more proud of our three children. Marine Corps Captain Michael J. Pence and his wife, Sarah. Our daughter, Charlotte Pence Bond, an author and the wife to Lieutenant Henry Bond, who is currently deployed and serving our nation in the United States Navy. And our youngest, a recent law school grad, our daughter Audrey and her fiance, who, like so many other Americans, had to delay their wedding this summer. But we can't wait for Dan to be a part of our family. In addition, to my wife and kids, the person who shaped my life the most is also with us tonight. My mom, Nancy. She is the daughter of an Irish immigrant, 87 years young. And mom follows politics very closely. And the truth be told, sometimes I think I'm actually her second favorite candidate on the Trump-Pence <laughs> ticket. Thank you, Mom. I love you. Over the past four years, I've had the privilege to work closely with our president. I've seen him when the cameras are off. Americans see President Trump in lots of different ways. But there's no doubt how President Trump sees America. 
He sees America for what it is. A nation that has done more good in this world than any other. A nation that deserves far more gratitude than grievance. And if you want a president who falls silent when our heritage is demeaned or insulted, he's not your man. Now, we came by very different routes to this partnership. And some people think we're a little bit different. <laughs> but you know, I've learned a few things watching him. Watching him deal with all that we've been through over the past four years. He does things in his own way, on his own terms. Not much gets past him. And when he has an opinion, he's liable to share it. He certainly kept things interesting. But more importantly, President Donald Trump has kept his word to the American people. In a city known for talkers, President Trump is a doer. And few presidents have brought more independence, energy, or determination to that office. Four years ago, we inherited a military hollowed out by devastating budget cuts, an economy struggling to break out of the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. ISIS controlled a land mass twice the size of Pennsylvania, and we witnessed a steady assault on our most cherished values, freedom of religion and the right to life. That's when President Donald Trump stepped in. And from day one, he kept his word. We rebuilt our military. This president signed the largest increase in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan and created the first new branch of our armed forces in 70 years, the United States Space Force. And with that renewed energy, we also returned American astronauts to space on an American rocket for the first time in nearly 10 years. And after years of scandal that robbed our veterans of the care that you earned in the uniform of the United States, President Trump kept his word again. We reformed the VA and Veterans Choice is now available for every veteran in America. Our armed forces and our veterans fill this land of heroes. And many join us tonight in this historic fourth. Tonight we have among us four recipients of the Medal of Honor. six recipients of the Purple Heart. A Gold Star Mother of a gallant Navy Seal. And wounded warriors from Soldier Strong, a group that serves our injured veterans every day. We are honored by your presence, and we thank you for your service. Just like these, we defend this nation every day. And under this commander-in-chief, we've taken the fight to radical Islamic terrorists on our terms on their soil. Last year, American armed forces took the last inch of ISIS territory, crushed their caliphate, and took down their leader without one American casualty. And I was there when President Trump gave the order to take out the world's most dangerous terrorist, Iran's top general will never harm another American because Qasem Soleimani is gone. Yeah. 
My fellow Americans, you deserve to know. Joe Biden criticized President Trump following those decisions. Decisions to rid the world of two terrorist leaders. But it's not surprising because history records that Joe Biden even opposed the operation that took down Osama bin Laden. It's no wonder that the Secretary of Defense under the Obama-Biden administration once said that Joe Biden has been, and I quote, wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. So we've stood up to our enemies, and we've stood with our allies. Like when President Trump kept his word and moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel, setting the stage for the first Arab country to recognize Israel in 26 years. Closer to home, we appointed more than 200 conservative judges to our federal courts. We supported the right to life and all the God-given liberties enshrined in our Constitution, including the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And when it came to the economy, President Trump kept his word and then some. We passed the largest tax cut and reform in American history. We rolled back more federal red tape than any administration ever had. We unleashed American energy and fought for free and fair trade. And in our first three years, Businesses large and small created more than 7 million good-paying jobs, including 500,000 manufacturing jobs all across America. Our country became a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. Unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanic Americans hit the lowest level ever recorded. And on this 100th anniversary, of the woman's right to vote. I'm proud to report that under President Donald Trump, we achieved the lowest unemployment rate for women in 65 years. And more Americans working than ever before. In our first three years, we built the greatest economy in the world. We made America great again. And then the coronavirus struck from China. Before the first case of the coronavirus spread within the United States, the president took unprecedented action and suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. Now that action saved untold American lives. And I can tell you firsthand, it bought us invaluable time to launch the greatest national mobilization since World War II. President Trump marshaled the full resources of our federal government from the outset. He directed us to forge a seamless partnership with governors across America in both political parties. We partnered with private industry to reinvent testing and produce supplies that, that were distributed to hospitals around the land. Today, we're conducting more than 800,000 tests a day, and we have coordinated the delivery of billions of pieces of personal protective equipment for our amazing doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers. We saw to the manufacture of 100,000 ventilators in 100 days, and no one who required a ventilator was ever denied a ventilator in the United States. We built hospitals, surged military medical personnel, and enacted an economic rescue package that saved 50 million American jobs. As we speak, we're developing a growing number of treatments known as therapeutics, including convalescent plasma that are saving lives all across America. Now, last week, Joe Biden said that no miracle is coming. Well, what Joe doesn't seem to understand 
is that America is a nation of miracles. And I'm proud to report that we're on track to have the world's first safe, effective coronavirus vaccine by the end of this year. After all the sacrifice in this year like no other, all the hardship, we're finding our way forward again. But tonight, our hearts are with all the families who've lost loved ones and have family members still struggling with serious illness. In this country, we mourn with those who mourn. We grieve with those who grieve. And this night, I know that millions of Americans will pause and pray for God's comfort for each of you. You know, our country doesn't get through such a time unless its people find strength within. The response of doctors, nurses, first responders, farmers, factory workers, truckers, and everyday Americans who put the health and safety of their neighbors first has been nothing short of heroic. <laughs> Veronica Sayez put on her scrubs every day. Day in and day out, went to work in one of New York City's busiest hospitals. She stayed on the job, put in the long hours until it was done, and then got back in her neighborhood and help neighbors and friends struggling. Her brother William is a New York City firefighter. And they're both emblematic of heroes all across this country. They're with us tonight. And I say to them and to all of you, you have earned the admiration of the American people, and we will always be grateful for your service and care. Thanks to the courage and compassion of the American people, we're slowing the spread. We're protecting the vulnerable. And we're saving lives. And we're opening up America again. Because of the strong foundation that President Trump poured in our first three years, we've already gained back 9.3 million jobs in the last three months alone. And we're not just opening up America again. We're opening up America's schools. And I'm proud to report that my wife, Karen, that school teacher I've been married to, will be returning to her classroom next week. And so to all of our heroic teachers and faculty and staff, Thank you for being there for our kids. We're going to stay with you every step of the way. In the days ahead, as we open up America again, I promise you, we'll continue to put the health of America first. And as we work to bring this economy back, we all have a role to play. And we all have a choice to make. On November 3rd, you need to ask yourself, who do you trust to rebuild this economy? A career politician who presided over the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression? Or a proven leader who created the greatest economy in the world? The choice is clear. To bring America all the way back, we need four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House.
fellow Americans were passing through a time of testing. But in the midst of this global pandemic, just as our nation had begun to recover, we've seen violence and chaos in the streets of our major cities. President Trump and I will always support the right of Americans to peaceful protest. But rioting and looting is not peaceful protest. Tearing down statues is not free speech. And those who do so will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Last week, Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence and chaos engulfing cities across this country. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. President Trump and I know that the men and women that put on the uniform of law enforcement are the best of us. Every day, when they walk out that door, they consider our lives more important than their own. People like Dave Patrick Underwood, an officer in the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Protective Service, who was shot and killed during the riots in Oakland, California. Dave's heroism is emblematic of the heroes that serve in blue every day. And we're privileged tonight to be joined by his sister, Angela. Angela, we say to you, we, we grieve with your family. And America will never forget or fail to honor Officer Dave Patrick Underwood. The American people know we don't have to choose between supporting law enforcement and standing with our African American neighbors to improve the quality of their lives, education, jobs, and safety. And from the first days of this administration, we've done both. And we will keep supporting law enforcement and keep supporting our African American and minority communities across this land for four more years. Now, Joe Biden says that America is systemically racist and that law enforcement in America has, and I quote, an implicit bias against minorities. When asked whether he'd support cutting funding to law enforcement, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. Joe Biden would double down on the very policies that are leading to violence in America's cities. The hard truth is, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. And under President Trump, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line, and we're not going to defund the police, not now, not ever. My fellow Americans, we're passing through a time of testing, but soon we will come to a time for choosing. Joe Biden has referred to himself as a transition candidate 
And many were asking, transition to what? But last week, Democrats didn't talk very much about their agenda. And if I were them, I wouldn't either. I mean, Bernie Sanders did tell his followers that Joe Biden would be the most liberal president in modern times. In fact, he said, and I quote, that many of the ideas he fought for that just a few years ago were considered radical are now mainstream in the Democratic Party. At the root of their agenda is the belief that America is driven by envy, not aspiration. That millions of Americans harbor ill will toward our neighbors instead of loving our neighbors as ourselves. The radical left believes that the federal government must be involved in every aspect of our lives to correct those American wrongs. They believe the federal government needs to dictate how Americans live, how we should work, how we should raise our children, and in the process deprive our people of freedom, prosperity, and security. Their agenda is based on government control. Our agenda is based on freedom. Where President Trump cut taxes, Joe Biden wants to raise taxes by nearly $4 trillion. Where this president achieved energy independence for the United States, Joe Biden would abolish fossil fuels, end fracking, and impose a regime of climate change regulations that would drastically increase the cost of living for working families. Where we fought for free and fair trade, and this president stood up to China and ended the era of economic surrender. Joe Biden has been a cheerleader for communist China. He wants to repeal all the tariffs that are leveling the playing field for American workers. And he actually criticized President Trump for suspending all travel to China at the outset of this pandemic. Joe Biden is for open borders, sanctuary cities, free lawyers and health care for illegal immigrants. And President Trump, he secured our border and built nearly 300 miles of that border wall. <laughs> Joe Biden wants to end school choice. And President Trump believes that every parent should have the right to choose where their children go to school, regardless of their income or area code. President Trump, President Trump has stood without apology for the sanctity of human life every day of this administration. Joe Biden, he supports taxpayer funding of abortion right up to the moment of birth. When you consider their agenda, it's clear. Joe Biden would be nothing more than a Trojan horse for the radical left. The choice in this election has never been clearer, and the stakes have never been higher. Last week, Joe Biden said, democracy's on the ballot. And the truth is, our economic recovery is on the ballot. Law and order are on the ballot. But so are things far more fundamental and foundational to our country. In this election, it's not so much whether America will be more conservative or more liberal, more Republican or more Democrat. The choice in this election is whether America remains America. It's whether we will leave to our children and our grandchildren a country grounded in our highest ideals of freedom, free markets, and the unalienable right to life and liberty or whether we will leave them a country that's fundamentally transformed into something else. We stand at a crossroads, America. President Trump has set our nation on a path of freedom and opportunity. Joe Biden would set America on a path of socialism and decline. But we're not gonna let it happen.
President Donald Trump believes in America and in the goodness of the American people. The boundless potential of every American to live out their dreams in freedom and every day. President Trump has been fighting to protect the promise of America. Every day our president has been fighting to expand the reach of the American dream. Every day, President Donald Trump has been fighting for you. And now it's our turn to fight for him. On this night in the company of heroes, I'm deeply grateful. Deeply grateful for the privilege of serving as vice president of this great nation and to have the opportunity to serve again. I pray to be worthy of it, and I will give that duty all that's in me. In the year 2020, the American people have had more than our share of challenges. But thankfully, we have a president with the toughness, energy, and resolve to see us through. Now, those traits actually run in our national character. As the invading force learned on approach to this fort in September of 1814, against fierce and sustained bombardment, our young country was defended by heroes, not so different from those who are with us tonight. The enemy was counting on them to quit, but they never did. Fort McHenry held, and when morning came, our flag was still here. My fellow Americans, we're going through a time of testing. But if you look through the fog of these challenging times, you will see. Our flag is still there today. That star-spangled banner still waves over the land of the free and the home of the brave. From these hallowed grounds, American patriots in generations gone by did their part to defend freedom. Now it's our turn. So let's run the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on O Glory and all she represents. Let's fix our eyes on this land of heroes and let their courage inspire. And let's fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith and our freedom. And never forget that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That means freedom always wins. My fellow Americans, thank you for the honor of addressing you tonight and the opportunity to run and serve again as your vice president. I leave here today inspired. And I leave here today more convinced than ever that we will do in our time, as Americans have done throughout our long and storied past, we will defend our freedom and our way of life. We will reelect our president and principled Republican leaders across the land. And with President Donald Trump in the White House for four more years, and with God's help, we will make America great again, again. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Vice President Mike Pence. How about that last line? Make America great again, again.
Quite a different feel from the Democratic convention last week there at Fort McHenry in Baltimore. You see that invited crowd, including Medal of Honor winners, paralyzed veterans. And if now you hear Hail to the Chief, you know what that means. President Trump and the First Lady now coming out to join the Vice President. After about a 36-minute speech that was a full-throated defense of Donald Trump, bare-knuckled attack on Joe Biden, I'm going to bring in Rahm Emanuel first here. Did he draw blood? I think uh, he did a good job for the President of the United States. It was a workman's like speech. And actually, part of it, it reminded me of an old Republican Party that's been blown away by Donald Trump, ironically given by uh, Pence for what is basically a total Trump Republican Party. But he served the purpose that the President needed, which is, and also softened up uh, like uh, Melania did last night. I, don't, I mean, there's faults in all this ever. Overall, he's going to do, he got his job done as a Vice President, showing loyalty, commitment and also laying out the case for the uh, candidacy. Chris Christie? Yeah, it's, it's what I predicted he would do, uh, George. Uh, a meat and potato speech, he laid out the issues, contrasted them with what Joe Biden has said previously and what they anticipate he'll say in the future. Um, and I think Mike Pence checked the box tonight. Okay, let's listen in. About to have another surprise here as Melania and Karen Pence come up to the stage as well. Here to perform our national anthem, please welcome country music superstar, Trace Adkins. Trace Adkins, veteran of Celebrity Apprentice. So proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still Fort McHenry, Baltimore, and you saw those paralyzed veterans were able to stand with the help of those soldier su suits provided by the Soldier Strong Charity. David, we covered a lot of ground there in that speech, including those in the path of Hurricane Laura said we were going to be stay safe, we were going to be with you every step of the way. He did. He said there would be a federal response, that FEMA is already uh, preparing for what could come. And, and George, I think we heard something else that we will hear under seven days left of the election. We will hear a lot from Mike Pence and from President Trump. He spoke of the hardship this year, a year like no other, but he said we are finding our way forward again. And he asked this question of people watching tonight, who will rebuild the economy better? 
who will be best apt at doing that. They know that Biden leads in the polls, but that there's a vulnerability that in poll after poll, President Trump leads on the economy. And that will be an argument they're going to try to make, even though they know Americans are feeling this pandemic and they are seeing what they're seeing in Kenosha and as we brace for a hurricane now in the South. That has been his greatest strength in the polls so far. Lindsey Davis, he also spoke out against Joe Biden, said not one word last week about the violence in the streets. I imagine many Democrats will say back, not one word from Mike Pence about Jacob Blake shot in the back by police. Never mentioned his name one time, and the only time that he talked about Kenosha at all was to say the violence must stop. We will have law and order. He did talk about directly uh, coronavirus. I think that if he had a thesis statement, it was essentially you will not be safe in Joe Biden's America. He made his case for why as far as economic recovery and law and order. John Carl, I want to bring you in on the coronavirus. You saw that, of course, Mike Pence, the head of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, he made the, def the defense of John Donald Trump the heart of his speech, of course, the attack on how the president has responded to the pandemic, the heart of the Democrats' convention last week. Put it all in context. Well, it was quite a performance. If you were just listening to Mike Pence and you didn't know what had happened over the last six months, you would have thought that uh, the battle against coronavirus was a smashing success uh, for uh, the Trump administration. George, uh, he did not mention uh, the fact that now nearly 180,000 Americans have died. Uh, he mentioned the travel ban from China, said it had sold, saved untold lives. But he didn't mention the fact that tens of thousands of people were able to travel back from China, America. American nationals, dual nationals, and that none of them were tested, none of them were quarantined, or the fact uh, that the travel ban from Europe, where health experts think most of the coronavirus uh, came from to the United States, uh, that travel ban didn't happen until more than a month later. Uh, so uh, a bit of revisionist history on coronavirus, but again, if you weren't paying much attention, a pretty effective one. And he also had that attack on Joe Biden on national security. He quoted Bob Gates, of course, served as Secretary of Defense in both Republican and Democrat administrations, including President Obama. He said that he called Joe Biden and was wrong on every major foreign policy issue of the last 40 years. That is accurate. What Bob Gates has also said is that Donald Trump is unfit and unqualified to be commander in chief and a divider. Uh, Sarah Fagan, how did he do? I thought it was a great speech. He did something else that was very effective and very intentional, picking up on what the First Lady started last night, which is early in the speech he said he has a lot of opinions. You always know where he stands. He's kept it interesting. He got a laugh out of the crowd. This is something that we're going to see more of, which is, yes, we acknowledge that Donald Trump says things on Twitter he shouldn't, um, but his policies are right. and. And he is right on the economy, and we heard that very strongly tonight. Yvette Simpson? I think he continues to talk to this small group of Americans, smaller, smaller group of Americans who don't think about or know what's happening in our country. He said, we value peaceful protests. What could be more peaceful than kneeling, which he was the most vocal opponent of? He says he doesn't want to see violence in our streets in, in protest, but he didn't mention Kyle Rittenhouse, who shot protesters last night, went home safely, by, escorted by police, and was just arrested this morning. Just the contradictions are <laughs> with me so significant, and I think part of that is he's talking to this very small group of Americans that don't represent most of us. Mary Bruce, president still on the scene there, greeting those who came out, along with the first lady, Melania Trump, and the vice president. This all sets the stage for tomorrow night. They got the pageantry they wanted tonight. They certainly did in Georgia. It strikes me as we look at these images and here at Fort McHenry, we are seeing something we simply haven't seen much during this campaign because of the pandemic. The candidates here interacting with supporters, something that normally we would see multiple times a day now has become such a rarity. And tonight I was struck by the biggest applause line here. It was when Mike Pence commented on the unrest in Kenosha saying, promising that they would be restore law and order, that the violence has to stop, but not once addressing the root causes, the root concerns of those protesters. Make no mistake, though, this speech was about Mike Pence going on the attack, playing that attack dog role, taking on Joe Biden, outlining the stakes in this election in very stark terms, George. Got a thumbs up there from President Trump. A few pictures now, almost socially distant right there. Some more thumbs up as well from the crowd. Tomorrow night is his speech. The White House now telling us, the campaign now telling us that the, pre, the president's speech right now slated to go on as scheduled. Of course, we'll monitor events all day and all through the night as Hurricane Laura continues to bear down on Texas and Louisiana. We're going to return now to our regular programming. For many of you, that is your late local news. Nightline is coming up, and I'll see you tomorrow on GMA.
Good evening, everyone. I'm joined now by Chris Christie, the former governor of New Jersey, Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago, ABC News contributor Yvette Simpson, and Republican strategist Sarah Fagan. Hurricane Laura is making landfall soon. Governor Christie, we've heard that President Trump is planning on delivering his speech as expected. Is it your opinion, depending on the disaster, that he should delay? Well, I think what he should consider is what he's going to do during the day tomorrow at a minimum. Uh, let's see what happens with the storm tonight. And I think it would be smart for the president to lean into this. Ron was talking earlier about, you know, uh, earlier uh, failures by presidents, uh, President Bush 41 and President Bush 43 in dealing with hurricanes. I was in the middle of one where the president, I think, did it the right way. You know, President Obama in Hurricane Sandy um, came two days after the hurricane hit, as soon as it was safe, and was with me and Andrew Cuomo um, every day of that crisis between then and Election Day and beyond. What the American people, I think, want to see more than anything else, Lindsay, in a moment like this, if it turns out as bad as it's being forecast, is for the president to be the person who goes down there and provides focus and strength of leadership and then turns the problem with their help over to the governors to manage. Hopefully the president will consider that tomorrow if this disaster turns out to be as bad as we're, we're forecasting right now. And tonight we heard Vice President Pence address the unrest in Wisconsin calling for an end to the violence stemming from protesters. Yvette, was this a sufficient enough response to the shooting of Jacob Blake? No. I mean, he didn't even mention Jacob Blake's name. And he spent more time talking about the quote-unquote violence of protesters rather than the fact that a lot of the violence has either been brought on by the folks who were supposed to bring peace, as we saw in Portland, or people like Kyle Rittenhouse, who was empowered by police officers with his gun. And after shooting shooting protesters was allowed to go home. I mean, it, 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 and even though folks said he just shot three people, he was able to go home. Jacob Blake didn't have a gun and he was not allowed to go home. He was he was shot in the back by officers. I mean, this is this is the tale again of two Americas. When I hear Vice President Pence speak, I hear about an America that sounds like this amazing place. It just doesn't apply to all of us. He talks about freedoms. Black people would love to be free from oppression. Women would love to be free from body control. LGBTQ Plus, people would love to be free, to live their lives like every other human. Again, he's talking about these ideals, but he's only talking to people who are like him. And that's not America. And it's really hard to listen to that in the wake of what's happening in Wisconsin and the outcry of so many people, black and brown and white, all marching together to say, all black people are saying is we want to live. Why is that so hard? It's really frustrating. Sarah, would you say that the president should have already addressed this and gotten in front of it to talk about Jacob Blake? Well, look, I think uh, Republicans as a whole need to do more to acknowledge the great pain and, and the frustration that so many African Americans feel. I mean, look, we, we've had every major sports team walk off. You know, some of this is cultural and political right now. But that's real. They're very, very frustrated. And so you've got to acknowledge it. I think the question is, what do you do about it? And how do we create a better life for all Americans, but especially people living in inner cities? And there's two issues. I remember last week, Monday night, um, there was a round table on racial justice issues. Uniformly, people said the two things that need to happen are economic empowerment and education. Well, guess who has better policies? Republicans. You know, Democrats block every school choice effort, and Republicans have economic philosophy that will actually help people get high quality jobs. We need to start talking about that too. Just want to stay with you for a moment, Sarah, and talk about coronavirus. Obviously, uh, Mike Pence leads the coronavirus task force. He praised uh, President Trump tonight as we near the death toll of 180,000. How do viewers square uh, the facts of those realities with the praise that we're hearing from inside uh, about President Trump's handling of it? So I think there's there's two things. There's the, the conversation and the rhetoric at the podium, which is sometimes good and sometimes really, really off. Uh, and then there's the facts of what is happening on the ground. And look, I don't think any American blames President Bush for COVID showing up on our shores. I think they think he could have done more to comfort people, remind people to do the smart things to keep each other safe. But the fact of the matter is he is a really aggressive doer. We heard that a lot in this convention so far. You know, he did put together the Defense Production Act. 
there's no conversation today about people not being able to have a ventilator the way there was in the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, he did rally private companies to make PPE and change their production lines to do that. Um, you know, he's done a lot of things, and he, they are right to talk about the things that they've done well. Democrats have really slammed President Trump's decision to host part of the convention at the White House, calling it unethical and claiming the president is leveraging the powers of his office for political gain. Rob, is it appropriate for the White House to be using the, the, the White House as a backdrop for the RNC, and is it legal? Well, it's legal. It well, there's going to be a lot of the judges are going to decide that. I don't think it's legal. It's going to happen. We're going to be way past it by the time it's over. I'd like to draw one point here. In 1992, President Bush had a hurricane, Andrew, in, Indi in uh, Florida. The Rodney King, which was the first type of a police shooting was ever filmed. And you had a major, an economic recession. So there's an echo of this moment that's facing Donald Trump. And if he doesn't respond to both, all of those crises, the economics, the, the hurricane, and the police shooting, not just in Wisconsin, but across the country, in an empathetic, directional way that includes all Americans and doesn't try to divide Americans, uh, if he did, does what he's continued to do, either ignore or only speak to one part of America, he's going to have a problem. And those incidents for George Bush in 1992 were basically a way the American concluded that he would tone deaf and out of touch. So I think right now you're seeing, I don't know if you're going to see if they're going to learn from history or they're going to repeat history. And we're going to see that and we're going to find that out. And they get better be smart and attuned to what happened, not just with hurricanes, but with other police shootings like Rodney King in 1992 going into that election. We saw Republicans reaching out to women voters with Melania and Kellyanne Conway and White House Press Secretary tonight. Beyond the speeches, Governor, how do you say that President Trump needs to really reach out uh, to, to fix his problem with, with white female voters? Well, I, I think you saw what the vice president was starting to try to do tonight and Melania and Kellyanne a little bit um, as well in the last two nights, which is the only way you win this argument is not based upon Donald Trump's personality. They've already made the decision on Donald Trump's personality. They don't like him. But the question for these voters is, which America do we like better? Do we like an America that Donald Trump is talking about in terms of his economic plans, his plans for education, others? Or do we prefer the Biden-Harris plan for America? If the president can start to talk about that tomorrow night, as the vice president did tonight, then he gives all voters, but especially those women, a stark contrast of what they think the next four years will look like. In that sense, you have a binary choice then, and I think that's a, a choice the president has a chance to win. Um, if you make it a personality contest, if we're voting for president of the senior class, Joe Biden's going to be president of the senior class. He's going to be the prom king. Um, he's more popular and he is more likable to a majority of American people than the president is. If this is about the, the policies in the future, that's where Republicans have a chance to win. The popularity versus the politics. All right, that's all for our roundtable for tonight. We want to turn to that massive storm taking aim at the Gulf Coast at this hour. Hurricane Laura, now a Category 4 storm, catastrophic storm surge. Extreme winds and flash flooding expected to thrash the Gulf tonight. Hundreds of thousands evacuated and everyone else still in the storm zone now must ride it out. Our powerhouse affiliate KTRK has teams on every side of this storm. We're going to listen to them now. Starts now. And good evening to you. I'm Gina Gaston. And I'm Eric Barajas. Let's give you a live look right now.